Welcome to the Finnish Institute. Välkomna till Finlands institutet. Tervetuloa Suomen instituuttiin. And we are so happy to be hosting this event. Sweden and uh, Finland versus the world. So dramatic. About the endless opportunities in the Finnish and Swedish games industry. I would like to thank you, the Foundation Kulturfonden for Sverige Finland, for coming up with this idea, initiative to this seminar. And I also want to thank you, um, yeah, the experts on, on gaming, the Swedish games industry and their counterpart in Finland, uh, Neo Games for the cooperation. Well, Sweden and Finland are the leading countries in the games industry. We are world-class education and innovation systems, but we can get even better by working tighter together between different sectors. We are looking forward uh, to an exciting afternoon where we are addressing questions like how can bilateral cooperation strengthen our games industry? How can the educational sector help meet the needs for talent and research. And, uh, well, the game, gamer universe is changing. What are the driving forces? And uh, before I give the floor to today's moderator, Pastor Beck from the Swedish games industry, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Birgitta Englin uh, from Kulturfonden for Sverige Finland. Uh, please, Birgitta. Thank you. I also wanted to greet you a very warm welcome to this afternoon. Uh, I just want to say some short words about why the, the, the Sweden Finland Cultural Foundation wanted to, to have this seminar. It's because we are promoting the exchange, the bilateral exchange between Finland and Sweden within the culture field. And we feel very strongly that there's a very progressive change and development uh, that's promoted by the the gaming industry and we wanted to know more about it and we want to find out whether we can help out in in the way you are already collaborating bilaterally and how we also can expand this to a Nordic collaboration through the bilateral exchange. So warmly welcome, we will pass to different perspective of the gaming industry during this afternoon and I hope you will find them all interesting. Very warm welcome, thank you. Kaxi. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Per Strömbeck. I'm the spokesperson of the Swedish games industry. It's great to be here. It's great to see you and you and you and you and you. Not you, yeah, it's you two actually. Uh, it's funny, the word bilateral. I love this word, bilateral. If, if we take one word from this afternoon, let it be bilateral. When I joined, the, and it's about time we say bilateral about Sweden and Finland. When I joined the games industry, and this is before some of you were born, I believe, uh, in 1996. Um, some of you were born well before 1996, I can tell. But you still look great though, by the way. Um, I was invited to join the games industry and I was like, what the games industry, is that something to do with me? And then I start looking at my life and I realized, well, games have been part of my life since I was a child. They've always been there, I just haven't really seen them. And when we were approached by the Culture Foundation to do this seminar, it was kind of the same feeling. Sweden and Finland, yeah, sure, it's always been there. We've always been working together, Sweden and Finland, Finland and Sweden, side by side. And there was a question, do you do something in education? Uh, not really. And then it, we started looking and we have uh, made a report about the Nordic game educations together. We have academic institutions collaborating. What about the businesses? Yeah, it's funny because uh, the most famous Finnish game is Angry Birds and they opened shop in Stockholm a few years ago. So now Angry Birds is made both in Helsinki and in Stockholm and so on. And the list went on and on and on. And we realized Sweden and Finland are, are so tight tied together uh, in every part of the games industry, except we never really talked about it. We never had an event before when we talked about Sweden and Finland as something special or worth talking about, because it's always been there. 
It's always been like that. But here we are, bilateral. So now, together with, with you, we will start investigating uh, our siblingship. Is that the word? Sibling, siblinghood? Our brothers and sisters hood? The Swedish and Finnish union in games. And I hope that we will discover many different layers on this onion. And also, as uh, the previous speakers said, looking forward, what can we do to build this connection stronger and uh, make it an even bigger part of, of driving the Nordic collaboration? I have some ideas. I think our speakers have some ideas. And I think you may have some ideas too. So you can start thinking about them right now because I'll be coming back to that. All right, we have a great show for you. Lots of smart people will talk and say more smart things than I could ever hope to do. First out, the star of the show. Are you ready? Give it up for Patrick Bach. Yeah, you can talk into my mic. Yeah. Can we use these mics? Hello. Yeah, it, it works. No one thought about this. Yes, I did. I put the mic there and it's working. Uh, Patrick Bach, you're the head of Ubisoft Stockholm. You have a long background in the games industry. You've made uh, games that are played by millions of players all over the world. One of the most yes. famous franchises. Mm -hmm. you, you now have double mics. Have You're mics. going to be twice yeah. as loud as me. Does this work? Yes. yes. Yeah. All I can right. now stand next to you. Uh, yes, I've been making games for 18 years, approximately. Which game are you most um, proud of? Oh, um, I'm not sure, actually. I, the, the, I think the game that I'm most you know, the biggest game is probably uh, one of the Battlefield games. I've been building Battlefield games since uh, the first Bad Company. Battlefield Bad Company, Bad Company 2, Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4. And then I was heading up the DICE studio as we were making Star Wars Battlefront, Mirror's Edge Catalyst and Battlefield 1. Wow, that's... Uh, <laughs> how many games are there? Uh, did you all play Battlefield? Who didn't play Battlefield? Do we need... All right. So shame. Maybe yeah, that's really that's like saying yeah, I've never heard ABBA songs. <laughs> I've never seen a Bergman movie. Uh, maybe two words about that then. What 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 is so great about the Battlefield games for those who haven't played it? Um, well, it's a shooter. If you like shooters, I would claim it's one of the best shooters. Period. Um, and now I'm not working with Battlefield anymore, so I have no idea. Right, we'll see what they're up to. <laughs> and now you're, you're, uh, you've joined another organization. Yes, uh, I quit uh, DICE and EA and I've now started a studio for a French company called Ubisoft here in Stockholm. And we are now, uh, we started one year ago, we just had our one year anniversary. Uh, and we're building a studio uh, to build you know, amazing games. And right now we are actually helping another Ubisoft studio down in Malmö called Massive uh, with a project based on the um, Avatar franchise. Uh, so we are now helping them to make something magnificent uh, in that universe. As in the James Cameron movie. As in the James Cameron movie. As in top grossing movie of all time. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that. Uh, but yeah, so James Cameron is actually making, I think, three new movies, um, which are going to be released s at some time in the future. Um, and for some reason, there's a game being made in parallel with that. That sounds smart. So, is there a Finnish connection? Uh, with Avatar, I don't think so. Uh, with Ubisoft, there is. Ubisoft ha actually owns a studio in Finland called Red Lynx, who makes a game called uh, Trials. Trials. If you haven't played it, it's actually quite fun. It's, it's quite wacky and it's quite popular as well. And I think they're releasing a new one next year, right? It's a motorcycle game. Yeah, yeah it's very, very motorcycle game. <laughs> Who's played Trials HD or... Yeah, all right, great, some people. Excellent. Um, good, so we have um, France, Sweden, Finland, 
and lots of other studios. Yeah, Ubisoft has a lot of studios. They're quite big. They have, I think, 30 plus studios around the world. So they are quite big. And they, uh, they do everything, including theme parks. You know, Ubisoft likes entertainment. And uh, because I always wanted to be a talk show host, I want to say this line. We have a clip. Oh. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's this one. Can we kill the lights? And up the volume? All right. So that's really cool. Um, so you have all these games, yep. studios all over the world. You're working with some of the most famous or the most famous Hollywood franchise. Why does that come to Sweden and Finland? Of all places, it could be anywhere. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's actually quite interesting. I, I started to understand that there is something with the Nordics, I actually talk a lot about Scandinavia as a kind of a, uh, uh, a great hub for gaming in general. And I think if you, if you look at the factors that are most important for game development, which is first of all, collaboration. I think we're all, it doesn't matter how, how, how we view our political uh, base, we are socialists. We believe in collaboration, we believe in that we are stronger together. And that is actually it's, it's quite obvious when you go abroad and talk to other game developers and you talk to journalists that we are different in that perspective. We're also based on a culture of technology. There's a lot of engineers, and I'm not talking engineers as in writing code, I'm talking engineers as in logical thinking. A lot of people, even though they don't think that they care too much about this, they are still pretty tech savvy. You know, my mother is 80 plus, she is, you know, she uses her iPad every day. She says, I don't know technology. She does. Everyone knows technology and they have a pretty decent relationship to technology. On top of that, we have an amazing climate. It's dark and it's cold. <laughs> it's perfect for game development. Why would you go outside when you can sit inside making games or playing games? So that's a perfect kind of foundation for um, making games. And the third thing that I think is also very important and I, I come to become a very important part of how I want to develop games is the aesthetics of Scandinavia. Uh, we have a very clear um, 
language when it comes to aesthetics. Some people call it like a, we're simplistic, we're harsh, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's a specific style that comes with the Nordics on how you express yourself. Uh, and also is connected to storytelling. You know, if you look at the stories that comes out of Scandinavia, they're pretty harsh. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty good and clear storytelling and we're very much to the point. And all of these things actually works in an international uh, on an international level. So in the beginning of my career, I actually tried to adapt to a more like, let's call it the Hollywood style of aesthetics, a Hollywood style of telling stories, Hollywood style of creating imagery. Um, but the more I understood what made uh, our games good, the more I stopped focusing about that. It's, it's, now it's more about how can we take what we already know is good and make that great for an international audience. So all of these things together is, is very much what, well in this case, what Sweden and Finland especially is, is all about. You know, we already have this. This is free fuel for us. We don't have to learn this. We already know it. So on top of that, it's just game development, which is hard in itself. But if you take this as a foundation, you're way ahead of the competition already as a kind of starting ground. And Again, don't take my word for it. Just look at you know, the data that you guys have. It's proven that it's a fact that we are, I would claim, per capita better than everyone else in the world. I'm just trying to explain why. <laughs> so, but th does that mean that the games look different? That the games are played different? Can you tell the difference? I think so. I think they look different. If you want to look at the aesthetics, I'm not saying that they all look the same, but there's a, we have a very uh, strong belief in, in uh, craftsmanship. They're great craftsmen in Sweden. Uh, I think from a management perspective, games, you can't just have craftsmen, right? You need to put them in context. And if you look at you know, both Swedish and Finnish games, the context is that we work together. We make things work. Uh, I think it's maybe based on necessity, you know, when it was, you know, <laughs> dark and cold and you have nowhere to hide from the, from the cold, you had to build your house, you had to fix it, you had to take care of the community, you had to care, take care of the village. We know how to build things together. And I think that, together with craftsmanship, is, again, um, something that you can see in all of these products. And then on top of that, if you look at the actual finishing quality of any product, I think the finishing quality of uh, Scandinavian games are really, really high. They always come out as, you know, it's, it's a high quality product. And then you have this exotic touch that no one really knows what it is, but it, it's what makes things different. And I think that's what you need on top of it. But I don't think we have to force it. And that's kind of my, my secret sauce is that don't try, just do. Because we kind of know what good looks like. And does, uh, does the studios, the workplace, the organizations, are they different in Sweden and Finland compared to other organizations? I wouldn't say to any other organization, but to many organizations. We have a very, it's back to the whole working together part where the, we sometimes simplify, they call it a flat organization. I don't think it's actually flat. I don't think you should try to make it flat. I look at it as more of a, uh, you should all, everyone should always try to make the best for the product, which means that everyone should be able to talk to each other, what everyone has to talk to each other, and everyone needs to be able to work together. And you should always do what is right for the game, which means that you will then automatically, it's almost like, a, like a, an ant farm, where you always find the most optimal way to get there because of necessity, not because there's a law or there's a structure in place. Uh, I often talk about hierarchies as in responsibility hierarchies, where the person on top needs to have a bigger responsibility, not more responsibility, but a bigger, a wider responsibility. And then that, that trickles down through the organization from a responsibility perspective, but not from a who's allowed to talk to who, or who has mo the, most, the best ideas, or stuff like that. So it's... it's it's actually more complicated when you bring in people from abroad into a, let's call it the Scandinavian work culture. We have to reprogram a lot of people that you are allowed to talk to me. I'm not here to kind of challenge you. You are here to challenge me. 
So you want people, you hire people, it's the classic Steve Jobs quote where you hire people to tell you what to do rather than you hire people to tell what to do because that's waste. So I often talk about you hire brains, not hands, because hands you can, you can outsource, to be honest. But where does that put the creative genius, the visionary, the leader, if, if everybody is uh, equal? I think from a storytelling perspective, from a PR storytelling perspective, you want that single person. It's easier to tell a story about the single person and the single individual, the hero. Uh, I don't think that's true. Very few of the big hits in, that you see from coming out of Scandinavia has that person. There's no single person. Media tries to simplify it by picking a person, or the company simplifies it by putting someone in the limelight to like, talk about this person because it's easy to understand. But I think in general it's more of the, again, the group. It's the team. And to me, it's, it's some people might, might like sports, other sports than esports, but you know, real sports. You talk about like, in football, the team that has the best team will win. It's not that has the best players, per se. You can create a team out of great players, but that doesn't necessarily create the best team. And from that perspective, it's easier to understand what I'm trying to say, because sometimes a team is very anonymous. You don't really know who's, well, who's the star player. It's like, ah, uh, none of them are actually the star player. They're all really good, but there's no one that is the player that will change the game. And also, making games is not about being good you know, in, in bursts. It's about being good always. You have to have a very high lowest level, so to speak. Which is exactly, if you look at the sports analogy, it's not about winning the pass, it's not about winning the match, it's about winning the tournament. Which takes a different type of tactics, it's a different mentality than just being, having a star that does this cool thing that you can show on YouTube, right? But what happens with decisions then? I mean, there's a deadline. Somebody has to decide whether the game goes this direction or, th or that direction. Where do you put that in such a collectivist mindset? I don't know how it's done in other studios than <laughs> the, the, the teams that I've been running or the studios. I, I usually say, and this sounds like a cliche, but you know, the game is boss. You place the game as an entity and you talk about the game as what is best for the game. You create a plan based on what the game needs, what the game needs to be, and then everyone works towards that. And if, if, it's, if it's not moving towards that goal that you agreed on, then of course you need people to kind of, you know, uh, guide people in the right direction and, or, or push or, you know, make decisions. But I don't think it, there's a, you can't have a single person making all decisions because game development is too complex, at least on, if you make AAA games, which I'm used to do. Yeah, can we just give us some numbers? How big are your teams? How long is a development project? What kinds of people work on it? Um, in general, it's, it's hard to give an exact number, but let's say a team can work, an approximation is like three years on the big project, and you will probably scale that team from a small group of people, 10, 15, to three, 300 internally. And then you will outsource, so approximately you maybe you will be 800 people working mm -hmm. at this, on the same project at the same time. And the budgets are, you know, you will probably spend around between 50 and 100 million dollars on it, approximately. <sighs> yeah, it's a lot of money. <laughs> so it better be good, right? Yeah. So you can't put your ego in front of making the game great you have to look at what's best for the game. And sometimes that's actually stepping away and sometimes it's stepping in. And it's back to the whole responsibility pyramid on who is, who is responsible for what? And then how do you make sure that all, uh, all of those things fit together? Do you make an assumption about like a hypothetical player who, will, who this game will be perfect for and then you try to make it perfect for that person? Of course, I think that's, that's um, that's something you always need to take in, in, into consideration. I don't think anyone, unless you want to make art games, is making games that you don't want anyone to play or enjoy. Because that, that, that's why I, I want to make games so that people can feel what I feel when I play games. It's the whole the awe of like, oh my god, this is amazing. I, I can't understand how, 
how you made this. Um, and I want to be part of bringing that experience to people. So what you do is, of course, you need to think about who is the player. But I think more importantly, you need to create a diverse team of different personalities that can tell you if this game is for them or not. Because then you have that in the team already. You don't have to ask. You can verify by doing consumer research. But I don't think you should base your decisions as you're making the game on data. You can, you can verify with data, but you can't build something. It's like running a restaurant where you don't like the food, but you think someone else will. And then you go out and you survey what people like, and you try to make that food. Instead of using your own taste and say, hmm, I really like this food. This is really good. That means that there must be people like me out there. And then you can verify that and say, no, some people think it's too much this or too little that. And it's like, hmm, can I compromise and include these people into liking this product more without me backing away from what the core of the experience should be? So to me, it's a lot about back to the whole like Scandinavian taste. It's like, if I like it, there should be other people like me liking it. And you have a diverse team, they will work as a filter. So they will be able to taste the soup and say, they also, if they don't like it, maybe we, can, maybe we need to fix something. Okay, so but Swe Finland and Sweden are so special. How does that work when you're in a global organization like that? <laughs> That's not even a trick question. Uh, <laughs> no, but I don't, I don't think it's... Uh, th there's, the complexity lies within like, cultures, right, in general. How do you communicate with people? In what order should you, should you talk about things, etc., etc.? Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, at least my culture, this is my personal culture, I'm very, very much to the point. Like, we, our goal is to, therefore, A, B, and C. So the whole... Small talk is, is it's often nice, but when it comes to making decisions, I think it should be based on uh, you know, rational, um, a ra rational baseline. Um, so sometimes I, well, it's probably my personality, I, comes acro I come across as, as pretty direct and sometimes very like, harsh. <laughs> if it's not good, it's not good. We need to make it right. Um, but I don't think, I think people are people. I don't think there's a, there's a cultural difference that you can't overbridge with the focus of a product. Because as long as everyone wants the same thing, because I think the biggest hurdle is that if your objective is your career, and my objective is to make the product as good as possible, we will always have a conflict. It doesn't matter where we come from. Um, so as long as you can align on that this is the most important thing, all cultural barriers are broken pretty fast. I've never had a problem with that, long term, at least. All right, so the, the Nordic sense of rationality will uh, make us... I think it will prevail, yes. <laughs> it will prevail. Thank you very much. All right, we look forward to playing uh, the Avatar game and whatever comes after. I'm sure there's lots of secrecy around release dates and stuff, so I'm not going to push <laughs> you on that. But I, I'd like to thank you for coming to this event and, and sharing your learnings and insights. Thank you. Patrick Bach. Thank you. All right, time flies. Next up, we have opportunities in the games industry. Uh, and to explain about the possibilities and challenges for Finland and Sweden, I have two um, very, very bright people who I am fortunate to work very closely together with. Um, from our own organization, Johanna Nylander, our, policy, our head of policy, from the Swedish games industry. Johanna, big hand, welcome on stage. <laughs> and from the uh, Finnish association, Neo Games, also, I, I think we can tell them, you're also head of the European Game Developers Federation, uh, Jari Pekka Kaleva. Welcome, the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, Anton, you might need to... There we are, okay, you were yes. fine. Here. The floor again is yeah, yours. I, I. So, I will, I will just introduce you a bit about how the Swedish games industry looks today, because I think 
hopefully most of you saw the, the Game Developer Index report over there in the entrance. If you haven't, grab a copy. It's fresh from the printer now in English. You can also download it on our website. And we are speaking about games here today, so it could be good to have a good introduction to see how, how the industry looks and how we have grown during the last years. And for Sweden, it looks like this. Uh, I'm, I have actually translated this into euros, so it should be easier to, to understand. We have the revenue turnover for the industry is 1.5 billion euros. It's 14 billion, 14.7 billion Swedish kroners. And compared to the rest of the world, Sweden have grown 17 or 16 percent, depending on currency, uh, compared to, uh, to 13 percent in, in the rest of the world. So we have a good, good growth. But maybe more importantly, we have grown a lot when it comes to employees. So last year we went up with 24% in employees and that's quite a lot with an industry that's just 5,000 people. And it looks like this. So one of the major challenges for, for the games industry today is really to find new people and to attract new talent. And I know this is the same in Finland and, and Jari Pekka will, will confirm that later, but this is like a really huge challenge to, to be able to meet this demand. Also because as it looks today, we don't even educate this many people. There's fewer people who goes out from the higher, higher vocational educations, uh, the Swedish yrkesagskola and, and universities than it is to uh, who actually gets, gets employment in the industry. So if you're looking for jobs in the future, games, this here you should go. And one way to, to get more people is if, if there was as many women who was working in the games industry that, that we have men, it would have been a bit easier to, to do the recruitment. But we are growing in terms of the amount of women who are working in the industry as well. We are now up in 20% in Sweden for the first time ever this year. And we are over 1,000 women in the industry and just I think it's 10 years ago, we wasn't even 1,000 people in the industry. So even if the numbers are still slow or very, very few, we are increasing. So more women, more talent. But also investments and JP will, will also tell a bit more about how, how this looks. But one of the main challenges, the other main challenge, despite, if, except for, for talent, is also to attract investment. And if we look at the investments that are made in the Swedish games industry, in, in Swedish companies today, they are by other Swedish companies. I don't know if, if you can see all the numbers here, you can also find them in the report, but the yellow mid uh, column is investments or acquisitions made by a Swedish company. So the blue is the total, the yellow is when a Swedish company is the buyer, the one with the money, and the pink or red one is when the investment comes into a Swedish company. So what we can see is that actually Swedish companies are 
bigger on investments than they are in attracti attracting foreign investments. So there's really something we could work more about. Of course, we had like big, big companies who have invested in, in big Swedish, Swedish uh, games companies like Minecraft and with Mojang and, and uh, King and Candy Crush, but those are exceptions. This is how it looks. It's Swedish companies investing in other Swedish companies. And this is also a bit how, how the values are, and we are increasing from, from year to year. So this was just very, very short intro for about Sweden. JP, will you tell us, tell us a bit about Finland? Okay, yeah. um, perfect work. So when we compare Finland and Sweden together, well, first of all, Sweden has the latest numbers. Our next round of this kind of survey where we go through all the Finnish companies will be done during this autumn and we will publish our new numbers uh, early 2019. So these are more on estimates what we are at the moment. So in Finland we have about similar growth, but we are lacking behind in total number of employees. So we only have about 3,000 people working for the Finnish games industry at the moment. Also in number of studios we have a bit less, only to about 250. But when it comes to the turnover of the Finnish industry, it's uh, 2.3 uh, billion euros at the moment. So uh, about 1 billion more than in Sweden. Um, the reason for this, so we have had a little bit different focus areas. So Swedish industry is very uh, traditionally PC, console, big AAA productions focused industry. And uh, Finland had, has had for a long, long time very mobile focused uh, games industry. Uh, but these things are of course blurring now. You have more uh, mobile focused studios in Sweden and uh, increasing the number of PC developers in Finland as well. Um, when it comes to investment, uh, the Finnish studios have been traditionally a little bit better on attracting foreign investment than the Swedish studios, mainly because there has not been any money in Finland, so you've been forced to go abroad. And it has uh, kind of worked and we have been able to attract that. Um, but uh, in addition to access to talent, uh, what uh, Johanna or already mentioned, access to funding is definitely one of the key challenges the industry is at the moment facing. Um, unlike in the United States, where you have lots of private capital available, the European uh, game industry in all European countries is relying on uh, public funding. And when we see the European uh, picture, we can see that in uh, Finland you have a particularly R&D focused games industry. We have a uh, grants and loans for research and development on the technological side as well as on the business model side. And uh, also a little bit of funding for starting SMEs. But in both Finland and Sweden, what we are lacking compared to the rest of Europe is cultural grants. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so happy to be here today, supported by this uh, cultural uh, cooperation um, fund here in Sweden, because that's re really the direction and the missing piece in both of, for both of our industries at the moment. In generally speaking, also in Sweden, um, you have had very little public uh, support instruments so far, and uh, perhaps uh, compared to the, like, the Finnish industry, it means that you also have a bit more these kind of big studios, because you have been relying more on them than this kind of growth on the smaller studios that uh, has been possible in Finland because of this, these uh, quite clever R&D instruments. But for example, when you go to Denmark, you see a really, really good uh, games developed on the cultural grants, which really pushing the boundaries of games as a cultural medium. So in the end, you need cultural R&D and this kind of SME instrument to really conquer the world. 
and that's in addition to funding and the talents, access to markets is quickly emerging as a, a third big challenge for both industries. So games markets are becoming more and more regulated year after year. In Europe you have a GDPR, in the United States you have COPPA both telling on how to make games from the data protection perspective. In Russia you have different rules for data protection. China is completely different uh, regulatory set compared to the Western world. So the regulatory fragmentation increases year by year on the global level. And it's not perhaps something that we see in the industry, because when we see the statistics from the games industry, this is how we see the world, based on them. If you ask from the policymakers, it's more like this. We have digital single market areas in, uh, United, uh, in uh, Europe, then you have a uh, free trade area in North America, and in principle, this should work. But when it comes to digital markets, this is uh, more or less the reality at the moment. So the world is getting really, really more fragmented. And that's the reason why trade missions, like the one we have here, uh, Game Plan Asia, that are really enabling you to go to the country, see how their markets work, what are the things you have to take into account from different perspectives, are the things that um, you have to have in order to open the doors for the global markets and know how to push your studio to the global level. Um, Anna, you have something to add from the talent perspective? or? Yeah, it, it is a global... We have a really a global market when it comes to customers and we have a global market when it comes to employees and to find talent and to, to attract people to, to come here and work here. And, and what Patrick said earlier about diversity and to, to have to make the perfect sauce that the games in a way are you need to have people from from all over the world in your team to, to make games that can can go on on the world so both education is of course really important but also be able to to um, have functional workers permits and be able to to move across across the globe is, is really important for the industry. Um, shall we go to Nordic Game Program or is something for the next session? Yeah, we can. Yep. Yes. So... Um, that was for us. Oh, ah. that's for you. So I don't know how to cover that. Uh, then. Yep. So just a quick uh, one point about that. It's also about uh, access to talent side. Uh, this kind of programs that you will hear much more in the next session are important for actually people to meet each other, share their knowledge. And access to talent also means being able to grow up the talent and supporting that. So, um, do you have any questions at the moment from the audience side on the Finnish or the Finnish games industry or our three big challenges on access to markets, access to uh, talent and access to funding side. No questions? No, but th then let's move on to the schedule. I think we are running out of time otherwise. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you very much. And we'll see you two back on stage uh, um, later, but maybe not much later if we're lucky. <laughs> Uh, and this is also a good example on how every, um, every collaboration between Sweden and Finland is also a little bit like a national football game or something. <laughs> we always like to compare numbers and have one reason or other why our numbers are better than, than their numbers, depending on which side of Östersjön you're on. Uh, all right, um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to my uh, brother from another mother, Kopi Hiltonen. Where are you? There you are. Excellent. Hey, please join me on stage. You can, why don't you grab a hand, Mike? All right. Hello. Hello, Kopi. Hey, how are you Hello, doing? Hello, Per. I'm still alive. Excellent. I wouldn't have it any other way. Why did we start working together in the first place? Well, actually, it was dark and stormy night. 
it was in 2005 five, five when your previous, uh, previous colleague Stan Selander called me. And he asked me one simple question, should we organize something in the Los Angeles uh, in the GDC 2005? And it was a simple enough question for a Finn to answer yes. And that's how we started. So by organizing the first networking event in 2005 in GDC Los Angeles. I was a bouncer at the door. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, was, uh, I was not the bouncer. I forget what I did. Uh, I was probably making a mess. And that started a, a, long, a long line of, of networking events because we've done networking events uh, every year since then, at least twice a year at the big international shows where we invite a thousand of our closest friends. Yeah, I, I guess that we have been doing something like 30, 35, 40 different kind of different kind of events, networking events. We call them networking events, but actual, actually they are parties. But we call them networking events. We will edit that out of the YouTube feed, by the way. Uh, and why has this been important? I think that when we started, uh, the kind of revelation for us it was that, that individual Nordic countries back in those days, we were way too small to be interesting to anyone. Because the total Nordic numbers were way lower back in those days when we started than the Swedish or Finnish numbers at the moment. And, and if we basically show ourselves as a Nordic area, then it, it's more, in, uh, more, more interesting for, for investors and publishers to come to meet our companies. And that was the initial reason why we started this. So we look bigger when we are acting as a Nordic area. But nowadays, I guess that we are all, at least Finland and Sweden, we would be big, big enough to do it ourselves. But I, I guess that, that we are so used to do things together that we, we, ra we rather do it, do it together than alone. The benefits are still there. And it started by trying to look big, by doing a, a great part, a networking event. Uh, and, and since then we have added a lot of, of different things uh, to the collaboration. Why don't you push uh, the next slide there, if you don't mind, Kope, yeah. and we'll, so it is. we'll show you what we did. So who, who in here has heard of the Nordic Game Program? Some of you, all right, good. That's, uh, that's going to be on the test, by the way. Um, the Nordic Game Programme was an initiative by the Nordic Council of Ministers, and it ran from 2006 to 2015. It's a culture policy programme, but I would argue that it makes a lot of sense also in terms of enterprise policy and education policy, and um, foreign policy as well. Um, so we did all these things in, uh, in part uh, or within the framework of that program. Look up there, you see Limbo, which is a, an award-winning Danish game, actually one of the best. It rained awards over this game. I'm not going to do a show of hands every time I mention a game title, but I know a lot of people here have played it and loved it. Crayon Physics, you might want to say something about Crayon Physics. It's one of yeah, it was a Finnish game, it was created by or kind of old-fashioned Finnish game in a way that it was created by one individual. It was a great success story. The guy who made it didn't want it to be a success story because he was a, truly an indie developer and he was kind of distressed when, when it became kind of a success story. But, but it's still a good game. <laughs> and he's the only one, I think, that who has refused to take the Nordic Game Grant because he felt that it's going to spoil his integrity if he takes the Nordic Game Grant. Free money, 20,000 euros, he didn't take it. So that's the way how it goes. So there were grants uh, for um, valuable expressions uh, and uh, they were very much appreciated by the, by the industry. It's estimated that one third of every game development company in the Nordics have applied for a grant from this program, one third. Um, and if you look in the top right corner, that's uh, the Nordic Game Day with libraries. So uh, we also collaborated with uh, other culture institutions, not only libraries. If you want to go to the Royal Museum of Technology and Engineering after this, there's a, a good expo there called uh, Play Beyond Play. Well, the first research for that was funded from this program. Um, 
and that uh, as an example of how, how we, with, within the framework of this program, could set balls in motion that other people then developed further and added energy focus investment to. And speaking of investment, I'm not going to take you through these bars, but they just show you how much private funding was added. So the blue part is the public funding and the red part is the, is the private funding that was added to the activities within this, this program. Yeah, and I think that mo mo the most important thing, or not the most important thing, but one of the most important things have been those trade missions we have been doing since, I guess that the first one was already in 2006 mm -hmm. when the Nordic Game program started. And it has been especially important for, for smaller companies because the big companies, they can go where, wherever they want to go. But for small companies, being able to be part of the, of the Nordic stand in GDC or Gamescom or anywhere is, is, is a great value. And uh, even though the program is not there anymore, we continue to work along that ambition. So Game Plan Asia is another example of how we have been able to use similar activities with different funding. If you're not joining us this November to China, Japan and or Korea, you're missing out. It's still possible to join. Come see me or Anton afterwards. Uh, and another example of how the activities that we developed within this program continue to live, continue to deliver, is the Nordic Game Conference, Kope. Yeah, Nordic Game Conference has been very good for us since 2004, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It yeah. started even before the formal yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, isn't it now the biggest developer conference, developer-focused event in Europe? Yeah, I don't know if it's biggest in Europe, but it's, it's one of the biggest in Europe. Uh, I guess that there is around 2,000 people. I'm a Finn, so I don't do marketing speeches. So, so there, is, uh, there is around 2,000 people, and for many Nordic companies, it has become a kind of get-together a uh, place where you can see your colleagues from the Nordic countries and it's a must go for, for many Nordics at the moment. And, and not only for, for the Nordics but it's also a window to the world because we've seen delegations from China, Korea, we have speakers from all over the world, we have visitors who come from South America just to go to the event, not even speak there. Um, and all of these structures exist, they're, all, they're still in, in place, some of, some of them are in kind of a hibernation, some of them are active now. But I look to you, if you are a policymaker or uh, if you are part of, of uh, the public sector, if you have an influence over the Nordic uh, policy making, the, the Nordic decision making, the best move you can make, whether it's foreign policy, education policy, culture policy, or enterprise policy, policy, is to restart this program. The structures are there, the experience is there, the value is there, the demand is there. Uh, we know that this works, it's a proven concept. And best of all, it will not cost the national budgets one krona or euro because it's all covered within the Nordic Council of Ministers budget. All you need to do is move some numbers within the Nordic budget. And to add that at that moment we are also able to place the other funding for, for to top or top of the cake so we can actually achieve quite the great things with 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 uh, relatively small funding, but we need something, some fuel to the machine so we can actually take some risks when it comes to the organizing activities and, and doing the pre-work. So that's just some food for thought if you ever want to develop policy uh, for, this, for this industry and this uh, p field of culture. Uh, and that, I think, concludes our commercial plug. Yeah, yeah. And if you have some compromising pictures about politicians, though, uh, those are welcome too, so. <laughs> we would never do that in Sweden. Or would we? <laughs> All right. Uh, so now we're doing a panel here, and I would like to invite once again Johanna Nilander uh, on stage to, to host this panel, because I'm sure you do it much better than I do. And Kopp and I, we will remain. Yes, you will be the good panelist. And up on stage, I would also like Lars Hjelmered, member of the Swedish Parliament for the Moderate Party. And are you chairman of the Enterprise Committee still? Or? Yeah, elected yeah. the other week. Ele yeah, elected the other week. Good, good, good. I wasn't sure if it was the pre or post election. Yeah, the coming, the coming Parliament. Yeah. Great. And also Lauri Rosendahl, CEO from Nasdaq Stockholm. Welcome. 
Do you want and me on that side? Is, I, yeah, yeah, I'm good, well, uh, this is probably better. And is Petri Ahonan here? Yeah, you're here, you made it. I saw you had train troubles this morning and I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to come. <laughs> yeah, but you are... Um, are you a business developer, manager? Yeah, at the game incubator. Uh, those who are the doing the, the nurturing the coming game companies, right. right? Yes. So let's start with, I know we heard you copy just, but couldn't you tell us a bit about the Tekes system? Because you talked <coughs> about, not about not a game, but not about Tekes. Yeah, well, uh, there is no more Tekes at the moment. So, uh, Tekes is called Business Finland, uh, beginning from the, from the January 1st this year. Uh, it merged with the Invest in Finland, which was Finnish investing agency, and FinPro, which was Finnish marketing agency. And now that they kind of, they are now called Business Finland, Tekes Invest in Finland and FinPro. And, and at the, but Tekes has still, still, still continuing the funding of the games industry. It has been funding the games industry since 96, so over 20 years, 20, 22 years now. And Tekes is uh, different kind of funding, uh, uh, funding instrument or uh, funding organization because it's funding the games business, uh, business. So it's not the cultural funding, it's the business funding. Uh, as Ipe mentioned, we don't have cultural funding as such in Finland, but uh, this kind of business-oriented funding has been uh, has been very effective. Uh, at the moment, Tekes doesn't have any uh, game industry-specific program, but since they have been doing it so many years, the games industry has become one of the one of the key industries for Tekes funding in general. And I was just discussing with some of the business Finland. Uh, people before I, I came here and they told me that during last couple of, couple of years they have been going on spending or investing like 10 to 15 to 20 million euros to the uh, game, game industry, uh, industry as, as a grants and loans. And the way Tekes is investing to the games industry is, or business Finland, sorry, <laughs> I always <laughs> miss this change. Uh, why, why they are, or the way how they are investing into the games industry is very simple. They go through different kind of project plans, and if they find that this project plan has some value for the national economy point of, from the national economy point of view, they are able to invest amounts beginning from 50,000 euros, and the biggest investments have so far have been like 4.5 million euros. And this investment can be used as a leveraged investment when applying or trying to get the venture capital funding from abroad. And uh, well, uh, well, since it has been around for a while, it seems to be so that at the moment uh, many uh, venture capital investors, they already know the Tekes or Business Finland investment portfolio and, the, and that the, and that, that they are investing to the games industry and they are even asked from a company who is trying to get investment, have you already been discussing with Tekes or has Tekes already invested for you? Because in a way Tekes and Business Finland funding has become kind of seal of approval for, for an investor who doesn't actually know should he or she invest or not. So that was the long story short. <laughs> Thank you. Going over to Petri, without a system like <coughs> Business Finland, how do you successfully incubate those startups to to becoming really big companies? Because you have a you have a couple of, of great examples of that in in Gothenburg and Skövde, right? Yeah, we have a couple. <laughs> and as mention mention them. Yeah, feel free to brag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, one of the biggest successes we have is Coffee Stain Studios. And I'm not sure if everybody heard of Coffee Stain Studios. But if I say the goat simulator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they started in our incubator back in 2011, I think. And uh, they released the goat 
to the world, 2014, and they have, I think they've sold about 7 million copies now. And their turnover is about 12 million euros every year. The profit is about 8 million euros. And there are 25 people in the team now. And they started with a team of 14 or 15. And then we have Stanlock Studios. They started at the same time as uh, Coffee Stain back in 2011. And they released their battle right a year ago now, I think. I think they have about four or five million players worldwide. And one of their biggest investors was Coffee Stain Studios. So we try to create that culture in, in our ecosystem that we paid forward. If one gets successful, they paid forward to the next team that are, that's coming up. And for the audience, how many people live, live in Skövde? Yeah, it's a small village of 56,000 people, and we are about 700 people working in the games industry in that city, including the university, which is pretty awesome, I, I might say. We started, the university started their first program in 2002, I think, and the first team coming to our incubator was in 2004. Unfortunately, they went ban bankrupt, <laughs> but they rose again. And uh, we started the incubator in 2004, and we started in Gothenburg in 2015. So what's the, what's the secret recipe for, for the success? I, yeah, I often get that question, and I usually say that it's the dark, long winter that we have. It's pitch dark about four to five months, so what else can we do than doing awesome games? That's and a lot of good talent coming from the university that wants to fulfill and create something that's awesome. Long dark winters, you're not the first one saying that. <laughs> Canada is also a, a pretty good country when it comes to game development. Maybe that's that's, right. that's Yeah, and creativity is one of the key things that we work with. Uh, obviously, we don't have the marketing muscles as Ubisoft. So we are getting experts in bootstrapping, trying new, new marketing channels, new ways of marketing the games. So the, the verification is very important to, to us. Yeah, thank you. But from, from incubators and uh, companies are growing and they become really big, like Coffee Stain and they invest in others, but then some companies are going, thinking about going forward and we have some listings on Nasdaq in Stockholm when it comes to game companies. And you have successfully done a couple of listings of Swedish companies and also one or is it two Finnish companies in Stockholm? It's, it's yeah. actually quite a few. Yeah. So why did you choose Stockholm and, and what's the, like the good Examples yeah, I, I think it's, it's both the ecosystems in Sweden in particular, but also now developing nicely in Finland when it comes to the gaming industry. And uh, I was looking over the weekend actually on this fantastic report, um, and, uh, and, and uh, I saw the number that in the gaming industry in Sweden you have 5,338 people working in the industry, according to this report. So I was curious to see that, okay, so how many of those are working in a listed company? that has listed on Nasdaq Stockholm. So that took me 10 minutes, and, uh, and I found out that that number was 3,520. So that's a pretty good share, more than 60% of people that are actually in the gaming industry in Sweden are working in a public listed company. Uh, and that is, to me, kind of proof of, of the pudding in terms of that the public market that we run exchanges, both with a kind of main market, where you have the Ericsson, the Atlas Copco, the Nokias and so forth. We also have the first North junior market for smaller and mid-sized enterprises. And we've been able to support with that market, as of today, more, more than 330 companies that are pretty small, but not kind of startup level, but the kind of scale up level uh, of companies that need capital <coughs> typically to fuel their growth, to go international, uh, to be able to hire people. Uh, and, and I think you know the likes of Starbreeze, Paradox, uh, Evolution Gaming uh, here in Sweden. And then we have had some great companies in Finland as well, like uh, Remedy, 
next games, uh, Rovio, and, and so forth. So there are quite a few, and they've been able to raise a lot of capital. Um, as you probably know, I hope you know, they've been fantastic investments for investors. Generally, if you have a diversified portfolio, of course, there are always some exceptions to that, but investors have great appetite for gaming companies as of today. And during the last three years, which is also here in this report, the market capitalization, the total value of these listed gaming companies have gone from 240 million euro to 4,800 million euro, 4.8 billion euro. And that's 20-fold market value of these, this industry on the public market. Uh, and there's been huge, as you probably know, there's been huge multiple expansion. So these companies are quite high valued, even in international comparison, which I see as a strong position for the Nordics. You get good valuations here if you go to the public market. And what you now have seen during 2017 in particular, I don't know if there's probably some people with experience here in this room, that these companies, the listed ones, they actually go out and they start to buy other scale-ups or startups in the gaming industry that they can kind of get in as assets, promising products, uh, promising networks of talent to kind of help them scale up their own business. Uh, you've been seeing like Starbreeze doing acquisitions, THQ uh, and so forth. So I think it's all in part of a very nicely developing ecosystem. And I think that the most important thing that I hear as an exchange operator and CEO of the Stockholm Exchange that I used to be uh, CEO of the Helsinki Exchange before, is really that I'm getting these entrepreneurs saying that, you know, during the last three years, when we started to go public to First North or to the main market, since then we haven't had a problem with funding anymore. There is plenty of capital out there. They've been really interested in investing in these companies and they can go out and conquer the world. So I think we are on a good way there both in Sweden already for a number of years, and now Finland is picking up nicely. So uh, uh, happy to kind of answer more questions uh, in terms of what does it really mean to go public with your, with your company. But it's working. Good. Thank you. Well, let's get back to that later. Uh, Lars, how can good policies support entrepreneurship, or should they... Should everyone be uh, happy on the market and uh, no help needed, or do you see, do you see uh, challenges and opportunities from, from a political perspe perspective? Of course there are both uh, challenges and opportunities for Sweden uh, looking ahead. Uh, as I mean, we all know it's an ongoing discussion in Sweden to form a new government who will be, become the new prime minister. And, and let's just say one thing, and that is it's much of a focus like who takes who and not and why, and discussing like the math, the number of seats in parliament, but less discussion when it comes to policy and policy reforms. And that's one of my key th points today. I think we have to discuss this more. Currently, it's like economic, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> economic upturn in Sweden with, I mean, Tremendous results for the gaming industry and, and other parts of Swedish uh, uh, enterprises. But the head will probably have some sort of economic downturn. Um, we have to discuss that issue as well. And of course, what could we, we do as policymakers? And I think one concrete thing, if I may say, is when it comes to uh, labor migration, uh, attract talents, then that's one of the most important things we could contribute as policymakers. We have had this uh, Bakka Tayeb and these concrete examples in Stockholm, but I think that's kind of a basis. I think quicker handling, uh, easier access to this uh, uh, personal code numbers, but also looking into reforms we did in 2014 when it was regarding non-EU EES uh, students and their opportunity to stay in Sweden after graduation and looking into did that really happen? Could we attract those talents or do we or should we do more policy reforms in that respect? And we have also opened up for new visa categories for investors uh, as well as uh, a talent visa as a new possibility to attract non-EU ES uh, talents ahead. So that's one concrete reform. But of course there are other things as well like taxation, reform of the housing market in Sweden, 
uh, educational reforms. Uh, and, and of course, we want to, to, to further discuss this with the gaming industry organization and others as well ahead. Thank you. Par. Last but not least, or <laughs> well, uh, if I may, uh, do, you have a specific question, or can I just you start can, arguing? You can start with, com <laughs> with commenting or, or or saying something. But I would also like you to hear to say something about uh, the cultural support because we have mm. had that up. But I think you might have a different take. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we take that uh, item and and put it out there? So uh, we talked about the culture policy program. Uh, with the, the Nordic Council of Ministers. And, and I would say that the main part of that success was that it was a culture policy program that was tailored to the games industry. It wasn't some policy that was moved from some other area and, and put upon the games industry. Uh, it was not something that was uh, dreamed up somewhere by uh, um, somebody who didn't understand properly the games industry. It was done and developed together with the games industry uh, in, in, with respect for the particularities uh, of, the, of the games companies and the game creators. Um, there are al also other ways to do it. We talked about enterprise policy here and we talked about access to investment, etc. The, the, the very successful policy with the, the matching funds in, in Finland, with the Tekis as Kope just talked about, um, in our other neighbors who are not here today, or maybe you are, Denmark and, and Norway, are you here? Um, the film institutes uh, also provide culture funding for um, uh, the game sector. So they have games as part of, of the film policy. And so that's a very different approach. And uh, some of them have uh, been able to produce great results, but uh, we don't quite think that that's the best way to help the games industry to take a policy that's different. If you think about what Patrick said first, how different is that attitude from uh, making feature films? Uh, th those are worlds apart. Uh, it was actually suggested by Mats Svegfors six or seven years ago when he uh, did uh, um, one of these public investigations about the film policy to include games in that. Uh, but when we responded to that, we said no thanks. Uh, so we actually, in theory, said no to some public funding because we, we believe that if you're doing it, you have to do it in, with the respect and understanding of how different the games industry is. And you know, maybe that was a mistake because we still don't have any culture funding particular to the games industry. Uh, or maybe we're just waiting for the right moment. Uh, but I think if you want to do culture funding, it's also, or culture policy, there are many different <laughs> ways to do it. Uh, the most, uh, the first thing you think of is give money to creators. But there are many other ways you can do it. So the museum that we talked about just now, or the libraries, uh, some of those are examples of culture policy. We're now doing an, a, a pilot together with the culture school, Kulturskolan, in Stockholm and Södertälje, to teach game design to children. That's also culture policy or slash education policy. So there are many other approaches that might be even more helpful than, than giving grants. I'm not saying giving grants is wrong. That was also part of the program. Uh, so that's just a few thoughts on, on culture policy. Yeah, and then in um, the UK and France, they have a cultural tax break. That's right. And Poland is on its way for it as well, I think. Yes. That so be something. Yeah, I think uh, the expert in this room on, on tax breaks is Jippe Kalva. So you might want to add to this at some point. But uh, in the EU system, you're allowed to do tax breaks uh, for some particular reasons, and one of them, or state aid, one of them is uh, for culture purposes. Uh, so if you need, if you want to do uh, a tax break for game development, it needs to live up to the requirements of culture policy and state aid rules uh, in the European Union. So this means that the, these countries, they have then a system in place where you have to prove that your game is cultural uh, before you can get the tax break. Uh, which creates an interesting challenge. And I'm, I'm, it's great if we can have some tax breaks. Uh, let's hope that we can make that needle's eye as big as, as possible. The Swedish, uh, the Swedish uh, parliament 
uh, has taken a, 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 a similar initiative uh, in the last, <coughs> is it mandate period in English? Uh, about uh, term, maybe? term, the last term, thank you, mandate period, the last term, where they asked, uh, it, it was all the parties in parliament stood behind this, can we find a way to help uh, uh, attract film location shoots to, uh, to Sweden, because there are tax breaks for that in, in, uh, in most European countries. So the Swedish film industry is at, is at a disadvantage. And that has now um, materialized, so there is um, a new proposal for something called production rebates. So it's not necessarily a tax break, but it has a similar function. Uh, and I, I think that's smart, but that, because that's also on the terms of the creators, it's also on the terms of, of uh, the companies. Uh, and uh, we hope that that will become, that that will come into effect. And we also hope that that system can be <coughs> expanded to not only cover feature films, but also animation, visual effects, and of course games. But that's in the future. Kope, you want yeah, to talking about that? tax free base, we actually, 2011, 2012, we had a lot of cooperation with the Finnish film industry to get these kind of tax rebates, no, tax incentives for, for both, and, uh, both film and games industry. And actually we crafted uh, this kind of cultural test for games uh, because it was start of, uh, part of the process. But in the end of the day, uh, we didn't get the, the tax rebate system, but it was approved for the film industry. So we have been going through this debate, like we did it like seven years. So, so if you need some advices, I have, might have some. Lars, you want to? Put it this way. I mean, of course, we are open to discussion when it comes to different types of support. I mean, looking into that we have for Swedish companies when it comes to Business Sweden, Alme, Vinova and so forth. So I think the key thing as a policymaker is bang for the buck, discussing this type of support vis-a-vis -vis companies and startups. So of course we are willing to take that discussion, but let me just emphasize that I think we also have some discussions to take together with your industry and others when it comes to these talent attractions in order to see in what way could we uh, develop that. As I said earlier, when it comes to housing reform, I mean, it's, it's troublesome in Stockholm, or I would say in the majority of the local communities in Sweden, we have a lack of renting possibilities currently. That, that's, that's really bad for Sweden and, 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 and company development in Sweden. So we have to do something as policymakers the next coming years in order to help you and your employees. That's a key reform as well. And moreover, we are willing to discuss these uh, personal option, I think in English is the personal warrants or something like that, in order what way could we develop that initiative as, as well, and uh, as well as other tax initiatives as well. And then finally, I must just emphasize since we have Schäfte, for instance, when it comes to these kind of clusters, and you mentioned in Stockholm, I can think as a policymaker that you do it as entrepreneurs. I mean, it's often coincidence together with talent that you form these kind of clusters. So we can make some sort of forms in order to help you, but you are the, the stars in this event. So different rules, kind of. Laurie. Yeah, um, I would add, and, and, and I have to say, I'm, I'm already apologizing before I say anything, that I've been here in Sweden now for three years, and before as the president of the Stockholm Exchange, and before that seven years in Helsinki. And I always get this, we are open for discussion um, in terms of, you know, policies that would need to happen. But I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really frustrated about the Nordic countries in terms of getting from discussion to action. Because I would argue that our policymakers still don't get it. That we are not talking about <coughs> a nationalistic Swedish issue or Finnish issue or Danish issue. What we are looking at, especially in the gaming industry, and it actually goes for Nasdaq here in, in Sweden as well, I'll get back to that. It's a question of how do we build attractiveness in an industry that is so global. We are competing for global talent. And what does an entrepreneurial growing economy want for companies? They want stability predictability, and the right incentives. And personal optioner in Sweden is one of the things that was a big problem, for instance, for Spotify. One of the greatest unicorns ever created in this region. 
And I think that we need to go from discussion to action. We need to do something about our taxation system in terms of and how can we attract talent into this region and how can we foster them and make them happy here, also from a taxation point of view. Um, we can make ourselves happy as well. So I think that there's a lot to do, because otherwise there is a risk that we will lose this, the competition. Uh, and I would say that, that in this kind of a globalized economy, just an example, and nobody knows this actually in this room, but for Nasdaq as a global company, we have 750 people in our Stockholm office. It's the biggest office globally for Nasdaq. Out of those 750, more than 400 are system developers. And we've been trying to get in more talent, and we compete with the likes of Spotify and Klarna and some of you in the gaming industry to get people to program and develop the fastest, fanciest trading systems in the world that we also sell to exchanges around the world, like Singapore Exchange, Hong Kong Exchange, Australian Exchange, are all running on our systems developed here in Stockholm. And it's been really hard, really hard. And we have had 30 to 40 open positions constantly over the past three years. And it's been really hard to find those global talent and to get them to move to Sweden because we want to have that core development here. And we need help. We need help with the housing reform. We need help with better taxation, incentivizing taxation opportunities. Uh, to be able to build on something that's already there, the demand is there. We want people to come here to work and they create welfare for Sweden. So I think that there's a lot to do here. Thank we need to go from discussion to action. Thank you. Sorry. I think Kope would like to comment on that. Yeah. Yes. I think that everybody who has been involved to the policy somehow is <clears throat> a little bit frustrated to the dynamics because nothing happens very fast. I, I guess that the biggest, uh, as far as I can see, the biggest thing is that, uh, that we don't realize how competitive the games industry is. So it's very hard to explain a politician how competitive the games industry really is. One, uh, one uh, example to shed a light how competitive it is, is to tell that there is a new game in Apple App Store every minute. There is a new game in PC Steam every hour. And there is two new games in, in, in console markets every day. So you can make the math how difficult the competition actually is and what kind of what kind of field we are competing and it basically means that that even uh, that you uh, to, to be competitive in this kind of industry where there is a new game app store in every minute so we need all the help which we can get otherwise we can't, can't uh, keep on keep on giving uh, good things to the national economies you want to add something? Yeah, sure. I have a long list of points that I want to make, but I'll, I'll try to be selective. First, I think it's really interesting the points you make about trading systems, Lauri, because that's exactly what happens in games with what we call game engines, the technology that the game is built upon, where you add the gameplay, where you add the, the, the graphics and, and uh, the sound, etc., all the assets. Uh, that's a, a hugely successful export from uh, the Swedish and Finnish industry not only business to business, but also inside the big corporations. We didn't talk about that, but uh, Ubisoft uses the Snowdrop engine, which is developed in Malmö in, in lots of different... How many studios? Lots of studios. Many, many studios. And, and the same is true for, for EA and DICE, and the same is true for many others. Uh, so it, it, there's a pattern here, right? And um, I was on a similar conference uh, in Bornholm, of all places, this summer. and. Um, that goes back to the point that Patrick uh, made. Um, the, the, uh, the CEO of the Danish IO Interactive, they're famous for Hitman, he said, we name our, uh, our tools, our game engines are famous, they have these names, Snowdrop, um, Frostbite, etc. And, and that is an example of the care we take, the pride we take in the tools we make. We take our tools seriously, that's part of, of the uh, part of the success. So it's, um, it's, I just wanted to, to make that connection between the, the, trades, uh, the trading systems. And then uh, to Lars, yes, I take your point about talent attraction. And, and we agree with that agenda that you, uh, that you uh, articulated. We, we would like to see all these things happen. And I think that there are also policies 
to be made in education, for example, to, uh, to make sure that we have even more resources for education. Compulsory programming in school and so forth, yeah? Yes, and, and, and uh, on that topic, compulsory programming in school, that sits now with the math teachers. That's a very traditional way to view programming. I would like to put it in, in the creative um, sub subjects, uh, the art and, and uh, if you, uh, I mean the point I made about culture school, if you put programming in that context, it's a lot more include, inclusive. Uh, math is difficult, it's hard and well we can argue about that. But, but I know that you're in, in enterprise policy, so maybe we should talk about enterprise policy. So what can you do then uh, to unlock more funding? And what can you do to make some of the systems that are already in place with Business Sweden uh, and, and other export authorities more accessible to uh, the games industry? Yeah, potentially, in Parliament, of course, the political parties can uh, uh, do uh, present different uh, proposals such as uh, initiatives when it comes to in what way should the grants for Vinova or Business Sweden or others uh, be used in this respect. Uh, often uh, these uh, uh, authorities focus quite a lot on, on uh, larger companies. One initiative discussed among parties have been before in what way could one focus more on, on small and medium enterprises for instance. Um, another one that was uh, uh, <coughs> discussed the other year one, uh, was on this research and innovation bill and, and that uh, was regarding these uh, incubators and the national program for science parks and incubators. That could be a potential thing as well to be discussed uh, politically. In what way should we focus on uh, uh, these uh, incubators or research uh, uh, institutions uh, ahead of that as well. So that could be some parts to be discussed uh, uh, the coming months in Parliament and in, in the committee. Yeah. We'll see you on that. Yeah. Piaget, would you like to add anything there with the in you who are on site on the incubator? Yeah, I wouldn't mind if we have more money. <laughs> of course. But <clears throat> money doesn't resolve everything. We need the talent. I think the talent is more important than money itself. And uh, the money comes in later. We, we refine talent and uh, uh, we are funded by the Hövde municipality, the Western region and Vinova. So we have three parties that we have to make happy. <laughs> To, uh, I think we managed it very good past years and uh, we are trying to create some kind of fund where we can mix public and private money uh, and there are some regulatory issues that we have to solve first but I think that might be a, a way ahead to accomplish something that's not so common today. What type of project would that be? Is it more early stage investments or for to, to make companies Well, it's out? primarily early stage investments and maybe seed round and A round. Not further than that because we have three years in the incubator and that's the furthest we can get with our teams. Uh, that's my assumption now. Uh, we are doing some projects within, in the Game Up Scandinavia project with Danish and Norwegian partners to see if we are, can attract investors and public money. Well, we, the Asians, they have a lot of money for some reason. Um, and they are been interesting to invest in our teams as well. But haven't they? Is there a lot of, because we saw earlier that there is very few foreign investments in, in Sweden in, in general. Yeah, that's true because uh, every time I'm in China and talk to publishers or investors, they are asking me, do you know the next Supercell? Yeah, I might, I might, I say, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to relieve reveal that to you <laughs> because we want to keep them ourselves. And we have Chinese partners wanting to buy all, uh, the whole ecosystem that we have built up in 15 years with the university, the incubator and the science park as well. I don't think it's not for sale. <laughs> because they are very interesting how we create games because we are, what are we, 25 million people in Scandinavia and they are very jealous of our creativity. We don't have the manpower to put in 500 people in a, in a production. So we have to be 
creative and effective in other ways. Lauri, first Sampai. Yeah, I would just comment that, that that's what I feel a lot of passion for, is to have a public market locally here in Sweden, in Finland, where we can support companies that go from startup to scale up and provide also the other side of the coin. The company gets the capital to grow and to invest, create job, jobs and create welfare in the country, but the investors always also get great investment opportunities. And I always say to my team that from an exchange point of view, Supercell, a fantastic story, first valuation where they took a part exit was like 1 billion euro and the second round was like 2 billion euro, it's like whoa. But it was actually a failure for the ecosystem that I represent because we were really trying to hard, really hard to get them to list on an exchange because it would have been a fantastic thing for all of us as private individuals, as investors, that we could be on the ride of these companies when they grow. And that's why I'm really proud that based on this report, it was actually news to me, I will make a PowerPoint on my own, that we've been able to take this gaming industry market capitalization from 240 million to 4.8 billion with a lot of new companies and a lot of value creation. And the investors that have been on board, and it's like everyone here in the room, I hope, with their ISK accounts here in Sweden in particular, that we've been on the ride from these small companies when they conquer the world. And I would definitely want everyone to have that kind of an attitude. Let's try to keep these fantastic assets in this fantastic ecosystem, this cluster, and create that value together on a Nordic level. We don't need to sell them too early to some, you know, Chinese or US Silicon Valley giants. Let's keep them and create and, and foster them, because I think that is also the biggest impact we can have on the welfare of the countries where we live. Per, you want to add something? Yes, uh, so first let me acknowledge uh, what Laura said now and before about how um, the, the, the success of some of the publicly traded games companies have created also knock-on effects, so it's not only for the companies who are actively traded on, on your exchange, but also knock-on effects in terms of better, anal better analysts, better, better business advisors, uh, other types of funding that's being unlocked because that there's a potential of a, of a, a listing at some point, etc. Uh, but I would also argue that um, it's great to have both the opportunity to have publicly traded companies and companies acquired by big overseas uh, Organizations. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, also a credit to uh, the attractiveness of of this region that we have all the main players present in this region, and we've also seen that when our local studios have been acquired by bigger organizations, they keep the name, they get access to more resources, they they grow, and they they. Uh, open satellite offices like the Ubisoft office in Stockholm, etc. So the best of both worlds is to have publicly traded and strategic. Now, I wanted to ask more questions to Lars because it's very unusual for me to have uh, the chairman of the business committee in Swedish parliament here with an audience of witnesses. Um, and we can take a fee game parliament uh, later on as well. Excellent. If I can bring my YouTube camera, that's even better. <laughs> No, I trust you to deliver on your promise. Now, uh, th what I wanted to ask you about is, as we saw uh, in the earlier presentation that Johanna and JP did, uh, there is a case of, of global fragmentation of the market, and our companies in most cases are so-called born globals. And not only born globals in the traditional sense, but also born globals in terms of delivering uh, to a global market of consumers. And it's also entertainment, so it's content. It's not free services, it's, it's entertainment content, very particular business models. And for us, it's really weird to think of the world in, in terms of separate geographical markets. Sure, we will make a launch campaign different in this market or the next. Sure, we will do some adjustments to make the game more appealing. But this, this appetite for regulation, the fragmentation of the global market, uh, what can you do? <laughs> what can you do to, to stop that trend? Because yeah, well, I think that's not helping us yeah, in the long run. Yeah, put it this way. I mean, uh, a Swedish priority has always been to focus on the uh, digital single market within the EU. That's, uh, I mean, a near reach for us to focus. And that's the current government. And I suppose whether less outcome of this current discussion would be a, a focus as well ahead. 
I mean, knowing that this is the most important market for, in general terms, Swedish companies, EU and ES areas, we have to focus. But of course, we have to calibrate it with experts like your organization to see in what way, what, what are troublesome for you in your business life. Uh, does it work in the way you want to, to be? Uh, and in the, the earlier, uh, uh, re, you used the term regulatory fragmentation, I think. And then it's important for us as policymakers, what does that mean in concrete terms? And what kind of recommendation in lobby terms do you want to raise with us? Um, I mean, as I said, once again, the focus for us is EU and the single market. But ahead of that, when it comes to other parts, you mentioned US and so forth. What, what are recommendations? I don't know, honestly. So you have to recommend us in what way we could uh, kind of deal with it. Um, so maybe not that much of an answer, but um, at least get back to us in that respect. So. I, th I think we will. I think we definitely will. Uh, it, Careful what you wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's soon we will have a coffee break, and I think a lot of people here are looking forward to that. But I would like to ask you one final question for this eminent panel, and this, how can Finland and Sweden work together to achieve even greater things? Feel free to yeah. interpret <laughs> that as you wish. Per, let's start. Uh, well, I think this, uh, this seminar is actually a really good example of that. I think there's a long list of activities, but like I said when I when I said hello, um, we never really talked about it in these terms. We never really talked about it around that question. So um, looking at that particular question, what can we do more together? And you know, discovering all the stuff that we already do, I think that's a great, uh, not first step, but next step in the line of many, many steps that have been in the past and will be in the future. Yeah. Laurie, will you go next? Yeah, I don't know if I'm kind of a, a perfect candidate to give an answer on that question as I am a Finn living in Sweden now. But, but I would say definitely, I mean, the way we work at Nasdaq, as, just as a background quickly, we run seven exchanges in seven countries. So Sweden, Finland, Denmark, the three Baltic countries and Iceland. And what we definitely do is we share best practices. Everything that works in Sweden doesn't necessarily work in Finland, but Usually it does actually, and, and uh, investering spark onto is an example of what we've been from the beginning when it was introduced in Sweden back in 2012. We've been pushing that in Denmark, in Norway, actually as well in Finland. That you know, copy with pride. It's a great invention. It actually takes savers to become investors in a very convenient, easy way, and that creates uh, good returns potentially for for. Uh, each and every individual. And, and when it comes to capital markets, I think that we actually now, when you take together, especially in the gaming industry, and this is just a kind of a teaser, uh, the, the critical mass that we've been able to build in Sweden together with that in Finland, in the gaming industry, we are actually starting to be very attractive for non-Nordic companies, typically from somewhere in the EU area, that they are actually looking at our capital markets to come here to attract investors to raise capital. And it's actually happening as a result of the forthcoming Brexit solution where typically London has been the financial center of Europe and it's not going to be that anymore in the future. So if you don't list on the London exchange anymore, where should you look? And in the gaming industry, I'm happy to and we have some other industry sectors as well, but gaming industry, definitely we are getting interest from around the Europe, from Europe and actually even further away, like Singapore, that, hey, what's happening here in Stockholm and in Helsinki in, in the gaming industry? Should we be where our competitors or peer group companies are? And we should maybe tap into the same capital market. And that's an opportunity for us as well. Yes. Yeah, I think that this, these are those economy of scale things we can cooperate. For instance, if we think about this talent attraction, there is a lot of things to be done uh, with the talent attraction in, in Nordic cooperation. Because in, from, from Australia or from New Zealand or from, from Latin America, Nordic is actually a one working area. It's not separate countries, it's one working area. That's something, that's something we had to deal with. Another thing we can 
week and together is the exchange in game education. There is things going on at the moment, but we can do better in those. And of course, we can uh, kind of sharpen up the things we have been doing so far. So try to again, try again doing this kind of trade missions together. Uh, now we would be big enough to actually get a decent exposure for in, in GDC or in Gamescom if we pull all the funding we have. So these kind of things. We have been doing things, quite a lot of things together and I, I see that there is old opportunities and there is new opportunity, opportunities in the, in the Nordic and Finland and Sweden cooperation. Petri. Uh, yeah, we might have a different approach to that, more hands-on. Uh, we, we try to be as hands-on as we can in Sjöbri because we're a small town. And uh, to, in order to uh, gap, the, uh, build the bridges between our countries, well, I'm a Finn born in Sweden, so uh, I have a different background that you have. But, uh, <laughs> and as is stated before, Finland is very mobile focused. And Sweden is very PC focused and as thanks to or because of the Swedish government in the 90s because every kid that's our, that are developing games today are born and raised with a PC in their homes. So, so I see that we can use our knowledge in PC games and make some cross games with the Finnish guys or girls doing awesome mobile games. We've done it with Danish developers, we've done game jams with Chinese people, and the games that we have created uh, that way are very different, very interesting, and the, the market today is, as earlier stated as well, it's, it's very competitive, so we need to be even more creative in the future. And when it comes to game engines, I think every team should you try to create their own game engine, because Every game that's coming out from Unity and Unreal, they look the same. They don't stand out, actually. So it's a challenge to all the new devs that are coming up here. Lars, do you have anything final? Yeah, maybe maybe one short thing uh, politically. Uh, I mean, first of all, you put it this way. Uh, like in the tradition is that for a new Swedish prime minister, f first foreign trip goes to Finland and vice versa just to, to show me how important this brotherhood is between the two countries. But I, one thing that lays ahead of us is the future of EU and EU budget, especially after Brexit. And I mean, our two countries are like, uh, stands for like openness, um, free trade, uh, uh, research, innovation, and so forth. And that, that will be harder for our countries when UK is about to leave the Union. So that makes it even more important for Swedes and Finns to cooperate together and with Danes uh, and uh, a few others if we want to, 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 to work with these important things. And, and to be concrete, ahead of us lies should we focus uh, more or less on cohesion policy and agriculture policy, using your and other taxpayers' money, and instead, for instance, focus more on research, innovation, uh, uh, single market, especially the digital single, uh, single market, for instance. That's I issues we have to deal with together, these two countries ahead of us. Thank you. I think that's a good final words for this panel, less agricultural money in EU and yeah. more innovation and games. Wait, let the agriculture money go to heyday. Yeah, and um, yeah, maybe Goat Simulator could have some of That's that true. as well. Give the panel a big hand. Thank you so much. Let's play the Finnish game today. Or this weekend, let's say. <laughs> Ante, what did you play? Uh, Walking Dead. Walking Dead? That's a Swedish game. Oh, right. Oh, that's, that's a brilliant example of a, of a Swedish-Finnish franchise. Did you play that just because you were coming to this event? No. Oh, you did it out of your own heart, uh, longing for zombie entertainment. I love it. Anybody else who's played a Swedish or Finnish game recently? Sorry, say again? Alan Wake, all right, yes, Alan, Alan Wake. Yeah, that's great. 
a good point because there's been so much talk on this stage how Finland is all about mobile. But let me point you to Alan Wake and um, Max Payne. And yeah, there's a strong AAA legacy in, in, in Finland. It's not all about mobile, let me tell you that. All right, anybody else who wants to share? This is the moment when we share our Swedish-Finnish game experiences. Who's played something great from Sweden or Finland? No? All right. Well, at least I had two. Immortal Unchained. Immortal Unchained. Excellent. Unravel. Uh, Unravel 2. That's great. Keep them coming. Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein, yes. Clash of Clans. Clash of Clans. <laughs> All right. Good. You see? It takes an active player community to be a great maker of games, to, to, make, to bring great creators. And speaking of creators, our next panel is uh, We Shape the World. I like to think of it as the education panel, but We Shape the World sounds so much cooler. So we talked about investment, we talked about markets and figures, and we talked about policy, and now we focus on uh, the stuff that we have been touching upon in all these previous points, really. Um, and uh, to, to host this panel, I have... Uh, first, Tommy. Uh, first Tommy, yes. But I thought... Uh, so this is a special panel because we have a speaker with slides and a panel host. So we have the panel hosts, that's Derpeka Kalava, whom you've already met, and the speaker with the slides is Tommy Johansson from the Game Assembly in Malmö, all the way from Malmö. Whoa. And voted, get this, they have been voted in the top five of the world's educations for games two years in a row. Fourth and second. Fourth and second best education in the world. Yes. Tommy, JP, I give you the floor. So, should I find my awesome slides? Is it it's the next one? There we go. So, I'm not from here. I'm uh, from the game assembly, and it's situated down there in Malmö, Malmö, Sweden. Very close to Copenhagen, so uh, there's a lot of cooperation going on there. But we're slowly growing in size, becoming the second best game hub in the world. <laughs> Stockholm might be the biggest yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, so I'm just going to tie the knot on the, on the second best in the world here. We, uh, the Rookies is um, an international um, organization um, uh, evaluating all the schools in the world, all the gaming schools in the world. And, and last year we actually ended up at second place in the world. And this year we, we have a declining course, so, so we're uh, uh, the fifth in the top five. But if we look up there, we actually have another school. And we have a couple of uh, future gamers in the room as well. Yeah, yeah. Woo! So, Future Game actually uh, uh, um, captured the second best school in the world this year. So, that's huge. So, in the top five, there's two schools from Sweden delivering people to you guys. So, I think that's kind of awesome. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, the game assembly and I will talk. Uh, a little bit about how we make games, so less numbers and less uh, uh, diagrams and more, more to the core, the feeling of games. Uh, I guess there's a couple of people that never have made games in the room and perhaps not even played games. So I will give you guys a crash course and, and after these hopefully 10 minutes he said to keep it short, so I will try to keep it short. You will be experts in making games. So we have a little monkey here, uh, and 
me, for me personally at the game assembly, I try to infuse a couple of key words to my students. And it's curiosity, commitment and cooperation. Those are the driving pillars for me that I try to shape the, the future game developers. Uh, curiosity obviously is a an elusive beast. It's, it's up to the students to capture that on themselves. Uh, but commitment, I can force them with times and schedules. And cooperation, I can force cooperation as well. At first, it's kind of awkward, but later down the line, uh, they all fall in place. So how do you actually make a game developer in two years? I have two years with my precious gems. Uh, it, it's, a, it's quite a big task, but we're trying to, um, to have these three things. We're having a tight cooperation with the industry, and we're doing constant group projects. And that's a key, constantly having these uh, group projects. Uh, and we're building our own engine. I will quickly browse through these uh, uh, three pillars, if you may. So uh, a, t a connection to the industry. Uh, we, we have a lot of veterans coming in, so that's, that's uh, Kim Koog from, from uh, King. Uh, he's actually a um, studio manager, I believe, in the King studio in, in Malmö. So he's a pretty big guy. Uh, he's currently giving some feedback and mentorship to uh, Annette, one of my level design designer uh, students. And back there he br actually brought his main game designer way back there as well. So those we have um, constantly. Lectures, we invite people, uh, all the future games do that as well, and they have super close to these awesome big uh, studios right next door, so they have quite a lot of that going on as well. Uh, but here we have uh, the lead uh, game uh, engine programmer, I believe, from, uh, from Massive, giving a lecture. So this really close connection to the games uh, industry is, is uh, super important to us. And the group uh, projects, this is for me like the thing that drives us to become game developers. So, so continuously, in parallel with everything else, we're doing these group projects all the time. And these are actually waiting to be formed into groups. And we draw sticks and we form a 15-man team. And we're trying to have a flat organization with no given leads or anything, so they have to cooperate. That's a key word. They have to cooperate to actually successfully build a game. Uh, we, we give it, it, it tips and tricks to do that, so they form task forces and, uh, and then do awesome scrum meetings and work extremely agile and push through uh, all these um, group projects. We're doing eight projects during our uh, time at the school. Uh, so, so it's a quite, quite frantic pace to the entire thing, and we keep it in check with a daily routine, uh, where, where I, where I have my uh, my second bullet point with with commitment. So I kind of force it to them there. So at nine o'clock, not nine o one, at nine o'clock in the morning, the entire team forms up to have a scrum meeting, a stand up where they talk through what they will do, and then I have a short, a couple of hours with my own lecture, lectures, and then they eat. I don't know what I drew there, two people dancing with potatoes or something. I drew it together with my kids. Uh, and then in the afternoon, they make their games, and then they go home and sleep. So eat, create, and sleep. I even think it's a studio named that. So here we have a bunch uh, of, of guys and gals forming a, a daily stand-up in the morning. So our engine. That's also one of our, our things where we try to make these game developers for, for, uh, to prepare them. So we make our own game engines from scratch, from zero. We make everything. So just a brief one for, for those that actually don't know what a game engine is. It's, it's a, a number of different components mashed together, and uh, so we actually can play 
something we can experience something we have a renderer so we can see stuff we have physics so things can fall uh, and we have AI systems so people can hug and, and this forms a game engine that that dude over there, by the way, that's uh, Gustav Rallmark. He is our programming teacher, so he's supervising the creation of all these game engines. So each group individually make their own game engine. So we have several different engines forming at the school. And, and, and why? Because out there in the wild, in the jungle, we have all these game engines forming in the, in the, in the companies already. We have Frostbite, Snowdrop, the Avalanche engine, the Northlight from Finland. All of them strangely connected to snow. I wonder why. Uh, so we need to do this, we need to have this game engine, we, we need to be in touch with the game engine so we can, so we can feel, and so we can really be there and solve the problems as game developers. And then we have this awesome game engine, what, what then? Then we have the game engine and then we just make a game and release it. Is it that simple? No. Obviously not. That's why it takes, what, what did you say, up to three years to make a proper, proper game? Yes, we have ten weeks. We don't have three years, but um, you, you um, work with what you got. So this single slide will make you all pros at game making. So this is 10 weeks divided in, in two week sprints that we operate on. So the first, so the first one is a pre-production and then we have the alpha, beta, gold. We have two betas actually because it's important. Uh, so in the pre-prod we, we fiddle around a lot, we do block outs and we do pipelines and all strange stuff and nobody have a clue about anything. Uh, and then we force ourselves into alpha, we do what, we, what I call a white box and we refine, we do modeling and texturing and rigging and animation with all our awesome props. Uh, continuing into sprint three, we are actually starting to see a game there. Uh, and that, that's where actually physics and v, v, VFX start to show up. And here, I wanted to hover a little bit here because this one is a game making uh, very important branch of. Because here we do a product that we sometimes refer to as release with shame. So we could actually deliver a game here, but we will sit in foster position in the shower for days after we actually released it. But we could, because it's a fun functional game. That is because we want, as a school and as a world, have a precious last sprint to find the magic. Making a game, making a game. I could teach any one of you here today in, in a couple of hours to make a game. It will suck, but it will be a game. But making a good game, that's borderline impossible sometimes. So for us to have a school structure to actually foster that, to actually learn to make good games, it's impossible to set up. It's impossible to set up in a structure for me as a teacher. I need for them to give the tools for, you, for, for the young kids out there to actually drive their own curiosity to find it. So we add game juice, it's a term. Uh, we have game feel, this Buddha sensation of stuff, and we do a lot of magic. And then obviously in the last one, super important for all the game developers, we catch bugs, we squash bugs, we eradicate bugs, all of them, so we can release this top tier gold polished game that isn't a released with shame product. Oh, he watches his watch. I, I need to speed up. Uh, so so this, this girl, this is Anse. She actually created my school, uh, the game assembly, uh, 10 years ago. She's no longer with, with us. She, she's not dead. She, she, she just pursues other things. Uh, she probably never threw a javelin in her life. It's my, just my vision of her. She will uh, be uh, personifying what I try to create at the school. So we have this holistic game developer, 
but the arm is actually our discipline strength that we have in a school. So currently, I say currently because it's constantly changing, we have five different branches. So we have level designers, I'm a level design teacher, an artist, tech art, animators, and programmers. Uh, those are our main courses that we... we uh, did I disappear? No. Uh, and then we have the speciali uh, specialization at the end. So we, the tip of the spear creates this awesomeness of a plethora of different people. And then we take this javelin and we thrust the shit out of it into the chest of the game designers. That's you. Uh, and, and, and the forum for that we teachers use what we call uh, the meet and greet. And that's also kind of a semi-unique thing for the game assembly. So here's a picture from meet and greet for this year. Uh, there's a lot of studios here. We have Soink, this, uh, we have uh, fast travel games, machine games, this strangely formatted Remed E. Yeah. Uh, so we, we have a lot of uh, people there. There's actually even more. Uh, at the side rooms. So this year we had 48 different companies coming to visit us, and it's quite unique from a, from a global perspective. There's, there's not many instances that I know about that, that do this quite successfully. Uh, and they are eager to pull our, our, uh, our people to them. I'm actually wrapping up now. Uh, my daughter drew this uh, Spider-Man figure when I, when I drew, the, uh, drew all the other stuff. I said to her, but you can't draw, you can't draw Spider-Man. I can! And then she drew that, so I had to put it in there. And Spider-Man had this awesome quote as well, because with great power comes great responsibility. And that lands on my shoulders, because that's why I'm a teacher to you guys. That's why I'm there in the grassroots to try, try to to infuse some moral values and drive a game industry into the future. That's it for me. So, may I ask the panelists to come on stage? And we have an excellent set of uh, speakers and panelists from a very different approaches on games education. And I would ask you to very quickly introduce yourself by telling us how does someone survive in games industry, where things are changing all the time, it's like new platforms are emerging on the moment when we don't even know about them, like WeChat in China has uh, hundreds of millions of users and it's barely known here in the West. Uh, I joined the industry in two, ten, about 10 years ago and we were talking about time before the mobile <coughs> smartphones, before iOS, and things have completely changed. So how does your program or your approach on education keep students uh, up to date on the industry where everything is in the constant change and nothing stays the same from year to another? Now let's start from the... Yeah. Yeah. And that works too, and this works. Uh, well, hi everybody, my name is Per Lagerström. I'm, I'm not with a program, uh, but I'm with a think tank called Futurion, set up by the uh, TSU, the Swedish Professional uh, Association. Uh, and we're looking on, on future work life. And I think that if anything above uh, new reforms for schooling and stuff, I think we need to have a mindset of focus on AQ rather than IQ. Uh, the ability of, of adapting and ability of, of getting change instead of knowing the answer to the next question. And I think that is the most, I think, crucial thing and it goes to, it goes, runs through all kinds of education as the, the, for the gaming and the, and the great example you heard from Assembly. Uh, <coughs> I'm Ulf Wilhelmsson. I'm the founder of the Game Education at the University of Skövde. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, research funding is quite important to actually, you know, uh, as being an academic institution, we need to uh, have uh, research and also uh, expose the students for our research, research and engage them in the research. 
that's uh, an important factor for me as an academic. My name is Alexander and I'm from the Socialdemokraterna, the Swedish Social Democratic Party, working with uh, cultural policy. And I think that uh, to survive the gaming industry you need to be well, ed well educated because we can't compete in technical terms with other countries. We need to be good at being curious, we need to be good at being creative, and we need to be able to change and be flexible because especially the gaming industry is changing so fast so we can't educate people into a future that we, we can't even see right now. So I think having a good baseline to stand on from the beginning is uh, the biggest part. Hi, I'm Antti from Saranen. We've been running the Game Pro recruitment program in Finland for around 10 years in cooperation with Neo Games. And I'd say for us the main point has been to find people who are actually passionate about game development and, and give them inspiration through people who are veterans in the industry. I think that's, that's been the key thing in, in our program. Should I use my yeah, so I'm Tommy. Hello. Uh, I try to make all my courses um, as a shell. So I create a framework for my students to, to experience and find their own fun. So I'm, I'm just setting guidelines and then I let them drive their own inspiration. Uh, that's for the courses. But then when I'm, I'm trying to lure in people into the school, I'm, I'm searching for diversity. I'm constantly searching for diversity and setting up a classroom that can feed on themselves. So I have architects, I have visionaries, I have coders, I have all the strength in one room and then they can help themselves. So there's, there's days where they basically don't want me around. So that's awesome. So as you can hear, in the games industry, the traditional education is uh, quickly transforming into something a bit different. And um, my next question is actually for Alexander and Per. Like, how can we have students who are ready for this from the traditional educational path? Because as we hear, it requires a lot. You have to be able to really widen your focus and re work hard over a new program to actually become the best in the world. But how do we secure that students entering the program have to require skill sets and knowledge to actually be able to do that? Well, I think it's, uh, we need to first check out what's happening in the, in the middle school, in the middle part of the school. and. Um, really checking out what's happening in the culture school and in Sweden because you need to be able to uh, be able to uh, learn how to be creative and master those skills because many of the people entering into vocational um, education are already very good at gaming uh, or at game design and have an understanding for gaming. I think very few people just, you know, they are um, work as a hairdresser and then suddenly decide they want to be a game designer and go on and take a two years exam from the game assembly and then getting into the industry. These people who are studying there have been uh, playing and thinking about games their whole lives. And I think we need to like take that uh, passion and uh, be able to learn, uh, teach uh, young people programming. We need them to uh, be able to uh, explore art and different kinds of uh, board gaming and stuff like that because they all fit together and give us that big baseline we need to be able to, uh, to be a really good game designer. <laughs> the quick answer to your question, how can we today, is that we can't. Because I still think our school system is, is stuck in an old version of a uh, high IQ uh, mindset. And looking forward, we need, once again, shift over to high AQ, the adaptability. And I think that Per uh, the, uh, Beck made a good point on, I, I think in a just a couple of years now, we will view programming as we view reading and writing. And it's not a math subject, it's something you add with creativity. And I think that uh, li listening to you guys, I think you're way ahead of other ways of schooling, especially for you tightening the gap between schools and, and work life. I think that's huge, hugely important, because now the gap between going to school and then work is way too big in our societies. And we need to close that by bringing work into schools, but also bringing learning into jobs. 
and learning into work life because this is this is lifelong and I think that it, going back to school is not the right answer for keeping up it's bringing learning into work life and the gaming industry as well so as we heard like one of the biggest challenges at the moment we are facing in the games industry, both Finland and in Sweden, is lack of top talent. Our companies are recruiting from the global level the best people to immigrate to these countries and helping us to stay on the top. Like there are companies in Finland have, have more than 50% of their employees coming from abroad. And of course it's uh, on the other hand means that uh, it's, uh, we have to make the um, immigration process much more smooth than it is. But the other side of the coin is that we have to level up our education. And um, how long is your program, Tommy? Two years? Yeah, it's two years and seven months, and actually. Ulf, you have... Uh, uh, three plus one plus two plus three to four. We can go all the way up to a PhD, you know. And uh, Ville, your program is... Uh, our program is six months. Okay. So. You have now six months, two years, or three, four years uh, for a person to become the best in the world. How are you going to do that? Because it's not about degree anymore in the games industry. It's about the skills. Are you able to level up from uh, this kind of young, young junior talent during your education to the global job markets where you can basically decide where you are working on? How? your program helps people to go beyond what is needed for a degree and to actually become the top talent. Ulf? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, we do have had some, uh, you know, famous student mm -hmm. projects evolving, like the Goat Simulator, like Battle Right. Uh, but those are they're very talented groups. We work together with the Game Incubator to help foster talents to go into business life. We are strongly encouraging students to be entrepreneurs. Uh, our education programs are rigged to inspire them to do that. Uh, we, we, we do collaborate with the industry, but being part of the governmental structure that poses specific problems due to regulations and things like that, you know, uh, can't work too close with business since we are part of the governmental structure. Uh, and that's why we uh, uh, use the Game Incubator as a good collaborating partner to facilitate that part of the education. Uh, but we do also have the problems of recruiting the talented teachers from abroad. Uh, salaries are low within the academy. Uh, the uh, funding for academic studies needs definitely to be revised. It doesn't work very well the amount of money that we get per student on an annual basis is just isn't sufficient, you know, uh, as is the case with research money. Uh, so that is um, a problem. Willem. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think our approach is a bit different in, because we're not a school as such. Uh, we're also actually partly government funded, but mostly funded by the companies recruiting the people. So first of all, our program is a recruitment program and the training is like an additional part in helping, helping people get, get the job in the industry and learn the necessary skills. Uh, but actually, because the people are actually selected by the companies in the beginning, so it's like a recruitment process in the, in the beginning that all the people, for example, if we had 25 people starting in the program, they are all already selected by the companies. They start working in the companies from day one, and we just give them inspiration through the veteran, veterans in the industry. So it's, a, in, a, in a way, a different concept. So it makes it possible for us also to pick out the, the really motivated, passionate people, get the best ones in collaboration with the companies and, and also tailor the training to the needs of the company. So, so it helps us quite a lot in, in making it happen. Uh, yeah, so my main problem when I set up a class is that I'm striving for diversity. So, and the, the first go-to source would be to have more women 
uh, women in games. And uh, when I was working as a lead, lead level designer in the games industry, I, I hired a lot of people. I wanted to hire ladies, I wanted to hire women, let's call them women, not ladies. Uh, but there weren't any around, there weren't anyone sending in the applications. So I kind of questioned what, what's going on here. So I went, went in, into teaching to, to investigate it further. And, and the people applying to the schools, the, this, the ratio there is quite low as well. So we need to go even deeper to get the diversity. And I think that will solve the creative force in Sweden as well, in Sweden and Finland. If we get the, the source material of diversity, that will drive creativity as well. So I would want to have more women available and having, uh, having more programming studies in, in, in base classes in schools so you don't have to, have to choose to become an LBS or, or something. You, you don't have to choose to become a, a game developer. It just happens. It drives you through school, the basic school structure. I would want to see that one. Wolf, yeah, yeah well, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, it, it's a real problem to recruit women to game education programs. Uh, and a part, part of the reason for it to be so is that their parents, which are the most important people that affect a young person to go into education, are very reluctant to send the girls to computer game studies and to go into what they conceive as an insecure work market, which is completely wrong. You know, so there is an attitude problem that needs to be, be addressed. And that leads back to the issue of computer game culture, which is really an important issue. It needs to level up and be more natural to take part in for everybody in society. More inclusiveness. That is a key issue that we need to address and we need to solve it. And we need to solve that rather quickly to be able to recruit female students into game education programs of whatever sort. In uh, Finland uh, we have identified exactly the same problem. And we have been happy to see how in you know, youth clubs focused on game development targeted for uh, children about 10 years old, there are already more females than males. So we can see that from that level, our structural problems are getting, uh, going to the right direction. And for a sudden we have another, this kind of bottleneck. And it's uh, actually to become an entrepreneur, become a founder of a studio. And that's the second point where we see that talented young uh, females don't necessarily take the steps to that direction. And in the end, when we talk about the games industry, it's quite clear that um, your first company is often your actual like master or bachelor thesis showing what you can do where you learn from your mistakes. And this is actually from Alexander, like how can we, if you think about it traditionally from this kind of cultural politics perspective, the entrepreneurship has not been usually in the field of culture. How could we bring it there and encourage people from the artistic background, from this kind of cultural mindset, also to explore the possibilities of entrepreneurship? Well, sometimes entrepreneurship and being an artist doesn't really go hand into hand and maybe shouldn't always go hand into hand. Uh, I think we need to be taking games into the cultural system in, in Sweden to be able to uh, support the people uh, doing, uh, making games not only to uh, creating a company or, or uh, or uh, trying to be an entrepreneur, but to like create something, create something that's important, create something that will move somebody that's not necessarily or supposed to be sold at some market. Uh, and I think that many artists are like outside that uh, that regular system of uh, welfare that we have in Sweden right now, uh, and that's a huge problem. We need to like take them into that. Um, and also, I think we need to uh, have more uh, of these. Uh, incubators and hubs and uh, be, making it easier to fail because the, from my experience of gaming design the most important uh, lesson is just to fail you need to get as fast into the testing process as you can you need to fail miserably and then iterate and doing it all again and again and again until that great idea uh, becomes an actual great game 
Uh, and I think that's a, go a good way to like m m making people um, saying that it's okay to fail and, uh, and, and helping them by offering good um, uh, safety nets. Yeah. Power, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think apart from four guys standing talking about diversity, I, I think it's I think it's uh, really important for the gaming industry, as every all other industries, to be better on how it, to explain what do we actually do here, because I think we see the product but we don't see the work. We have no idea what it is to work at the uh, the studios that you mentioned, and I think there's a there's a lot. Uh, if we could get that image out, uh, how much creativity, how much storytelling, how much uh, art directing it is within the gaming industry, that would, that would attract a whole different uh, or, or a wider, more diverse uh, audience. And I think that's hugely important because otherwise it will just go on, you know, it's, it's, it's the tech guys making tech things and then out comes uh, a, a game where uh, I had a meeting with people at Dice uh, the other week, and I was just amazed on how how many different ver various uh, people you need and skills. And I think showing what you do at work, not just the product, which is just the output, uh, I, I think that would that, that that is a lesson for all industries and also for the gaming industry. <laughs> So luckily we have a next panel totally focusing on the diversity topic with a little bit more diverse uh, uh, balancing setting on this uh, sort, uh, topic. Um, but before we go there, there is also something that is very rarely discussed. And it's uh, the future of games education. And uh, what we see now that increasingly studios are using uh, this kind of material available from Coursera and this kind of massive online learning platforms for internal trainings on those materials, especially on the coding side, but slowly also on the artistic side, are taking a more important role in setting the required skill level. And it's very high. You need a mathematics degree to actually so go through some of those courses. So how do you see the games education in the post-degree world? Where in the you don't anymore have degrees, you have just this kind of certificates, uh, systems existing where you kind of have to be able to, when you join the company, to pass certain courses. <coughs> but it's going to be very difficult for the students to actually reach that level. Yeah, I, just let me start. The ed tech sector, the education technical sector is growing maybe f as fast as the gaming industry. And what they are seeing is that all the growth takes place within lear uh, lifelong learning. And what they are aiming for, and I think that you targeted a lot from, from your, uh, that your talk before, is that it needs, to be, uh, it needs to be micro, it needs to be on demand, it needs to be here when I need it. It needs to be simplified. Small. I mean, if you just look at the MOOCs, the massive online courses, like 7% or something that finish a MOOC. Uh, which tells me that nobody has time to, 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 to take a degree, and that's not what you're after. You're after this skill at this point when I need it, and that's, that's how uh, I think lifelong learning in any industry, as uh, the gaming industry and the gaming schools, need, needs to have that approach. Antti, what um, traditional educational institutions could learn from your program that is six months? And that's it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to compare. It's basically we're doing a di different thing. But I, I think the most important thing, what was already discussed, is having the companies in, in the process as early as possible, because the companies know what they actually need from the people. They, they, they have the need for the people, different roles, different, different skill sets. So having the companies as early as possible included, I think that's the key thing. Um, Tommy and Ulf, how do you change uh, your um, educational systems to face this kind of challenge? Uh, I, I've seen uh, a development that I'm not sure if it's scary or not, but when I began in, in the games industry, there were basically no schools. There were basically no school structure, and, and the people that walk, went into the school system and out at the other end to get, try to get into the games industry, they, they they were almost worse off because they were the 
the outcasts, uh, the, the, the people that didn't really have a goal in life, so they are, I guess I'll go to a school educating me into a games developer. Uh, but it's changed, so nowadays I see a complete shift, so it's almost so, so a lot of game studios don't hire people if they haven't gone through the process of a school, and, and our school is discussing uh, alternatives to, to, uh, to lower the, the line uh, in front of us. Uh, we have a massive amount of applications to our school. So we are currently discussing to, to have a pre-school pre sort of, to, to educate them and to prepare them to stand in line to get into our school. So we are just extending this line further and further and further away. So it almost feels like this elusive at the end of the rainbow to actually get into the games industry. Because first you have to line up to this preschool, and then you have to line up to the school, and then you have to line up to actually get into the industry. So I'm not sure if it's scary or not, but the schools is becoming way more important. Uh, well, uh, first of all, a degree is a certificate. It is a certificate of a specific skills. And the skills are regulated by law <laughs> when it comes to academic studies. Uh, but uh, for us to change, um, what we do uh, is that we are primarily, as I said, uh, encouraging the entrepreneurship. And we are also solidly based in you know, academic uh, studies, theories, practices, uh, which has a value of its own. Uh, and the value is that don't repeat what others already had done. Do something new and creatively. And that is possible since we do have subject areas that, you know, st draws its inspiration from art, from literature, from architecture, and, you know, quite traditional academic subject areas that we have merged together into computer game education. Uh, so we are not primarily fulfilling uh, short-term needs for the industry with an academic uh, education. We are rather creating game changers that will be a new driving force within the industry, as the guys and girls at the GOAT simulator has properly shown. So, how are you as a policymaker are going to ch enable this kind of change and keep the good work up what we have already in Sweden? I think it's an important part here because we have to, to acknowledge why we're educating people. We're doing it partly to fill uh, the, the gaming industry today with great and talented people to fill the, uh, the need for personnel and we're trying to educate young people to form the new companies that we, we don't know yet. And right now I think it's very top heavy on the focus on vocational training. We have a few uh, really good vocational training uh, educations in Sweden and we have essentially uh, Skövde's uh, education um, uh, and, and that's essentially it. You can't uh, study game design, serious game design in Gothenburg, you can't study it in Stockholm, you can't study it in Malmö, or any other of the big uh, universities in Sweden. And I think that shows that what we need is a, a cohesive strategy for this, where we spread out the education, not only on the vocational side, but also have a big uh, theoretical, heavy game studies um, research focus in the, in the university, in the high schools, and also uh, a big baseline in, in uh, crafts and arts and programming in the, in the lower schools. That together will form a chain or a stair, if you will. Uh, then you can like hop in or hop out wherever you like. But right now it's in reality only one chance, and that's, uh, that's vocational training facilities, I would say. Or if you do yep. go f through Skövde and then into an incubator, or if you're just really talented and you learn by doing yourself and making a game and making it a hit. Sorry, we are run out of time, so it's time for the next panel <laughs> on the stage. But first, we're after the um, uh, discussions and panels, uh, anyone in the audience can ask uh, their questions from the panel members. Thank you. Thanks. Harp. Yay. Thanks a lot, panel. Thanks a lot, JP. Uh, I'd like to invite the next panelists up on stage. And as you approach me, 
This is now going to be that really weird, awkward moment when the moderator asks you to please stand up. And you kind of do a little bit of this. And then you kind of do a little bit of this. And then you kind of do a little bit of this. Oh. And then you kind of get stuck on your mic cord. And then you do a little bit of this. And you get stuck on the mic cord again. Feel better? No, no, that's not coming on the photo. <laughs> it's all over now. <laughs> too slow. I shook too fast. Couldn't catch me. Nice try, though. All right. And now you, you're allowed to sit back down. Thanks for doing that. It was uh, fun for me because I got to see all of you move weirdly and awkwardly. All right. Aveline Estier, Estier, where are you? Here. Welcome. Please join us. Hey! Hey! And Lily Kleerfeldt. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, Sonja Engesleve. Is that close enough? Yeah. That's good. All right. Are you happy with the, the table yeah. mics and hand mics and stuff? <laughs> All right. Okay, excellent lead-in from the previous uh, panel. They talked about education, but that led them to talk a lot about diversity. Yeah. This, also, this panel will also talk a lot about diversity, I think, but maybe from a different perspective, from the perspective of, of the, the players, the gamers. Uh, we can talk about other stuff too. But first, uh, the name of this panel is the gamer universe is changing, game culture, the gamer universe is changing, but what are the driving forces? Who here was at uh, NASDAQ uh, on uh, September 12, was it, for the Investing Games event? Hands up. Do you remember the name of uh, the title of the keynote speech? Okay, I'll remind, I'll do it for you. Uh, the next two billion players, the next two billion players. I think that's the same point that underpins this panel, right? So, who are the new players? Uh, Lily, female legends. Yeah. What's that? Well, it's an esport community for girls and non-binary who's into esports. Um, well, that's how we started. And I was thinking a bit about what they said in the previous panel that the, there is an issue uh, that not a lot of, uh, not enough female apply for a job, um, and they talk about that that it's an issue, but they didn't talk about many solutions. Um, and I think I think that's sad. Um, what we see a lot in the in the community is that. Uh, the main reason that the girls don't apply is because they don't think they can apply, they don't think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's pointed at them, because society has told them differently um, through all of, their, all of the years. I mean, they start, as soon as they start playing, they hear that females don't play games, uh, females go back to the kitchen, make me a sandwich kind of comments. So what a lot of people miss is, is that um, they don't start at the blank, blank slate, they start at uh, uphill. They start with a, with a feeling that this is not for them, they are not included here. So you, also, you always have to start with showing that this will be differently, that this is a different company or this is a different school. You have to show them um, that this time it will be different and that you actually take them seriously. Um, and this is also extremely important to have role models and show that this school actually cares about females because they've been told differently all of their, all of their gaming lives. All right, good. Thanks for that point. We'll get back to some of the... Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, but brilliant. That's we started, the best I mean, thing that's been We started, we started as an esport community just to make it easier for girls to find each other and to make uh, teams and play together. But what we saw, uh, what we saw was that there is an issue all over the gaming industry. It's not just for the players, and it's not. Um, I've been talking a lot with with Kim that was supposed to be here at Diversity, and it's the same kind of issues females have at the gaming 
companies. So I mean, they start with playing the games and then they get interested in games and they try to get into the gaming industry and they face the same kind of difficulties and they face the kind, same kind of attitudes. So it's a, a global problem. So yeah, we started to, to help girls just find each other and to play games and then we realized that this is a much bigger problem. So we have started to work more and more together with, with other companies and organizations to actually try to fix this problem on a more global level. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, it, it, I'm not saying that's what they said, but as audience, you could take away from the last panel that uh, this is something for the educators to fix. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that you need to bring together all kinds of different parts of, of the ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Avelyn, women in games, what is that? Um, I mean, the, the name says a lot, but still. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's not just women. It's like women and non-binary as well. Uh, so we don't judge on that part. Um, so we're basically a small organization um, trying to host um, women and non-binary people to like small uh, conferences at companies. So we had a few breakfast lunches at like um, where I work at Dice and um, also at like King and other places. And we also have lunches that we organize internally with just the people attending them to talk about how it's like to work in games and also like meet other people. Because especially if you're um, a non-Swede or something, it's a lot harder to actually get to know people and those kind of environments are great for that. So that is what you do, but why do you do that? Um, we do it so that people can feel a bit more connected and have a way of um, not just venting, but also getting some feedback from other people uh, around the community on these things. So these are groups that are not, that, are, that they feel that they are apart from, from the general games community? Or how does that play out? Why, why is it necessary to make special events for, for these people? Um, well, if I want to give an example, um, there are a few uh, smaller gaming events out there or just like evenings where people go out to a bar or to a park or something and people talk about games and it has happened more than once that uh, women get harassed over there as well because they assume you're either their plus one or you don't belong there. Uh, so having these small, uh, like, um, inclusive groups just for, for women and non-binaries is just more of a safer place for them to express themselves. Mm -hmm. All right, good. So we have the player community and we have the people working inside the industry. Sonia, uh, what, what do you bring to this conversation? Um, so I, I guess I, I have... I'm still in the introduction. I have, I have an even more holistic <laughs> perspective to... Uh, to the discussion. So yeah, I'm the chairman of the board in, in Neo Games. Um, I'm in the industry for working for Zynga. I'm, I actually started Women in Games in Finland eight years ago. So I, I, I do like collaboration with the primary schools because I also feel that if you want to make an impact, you have to make it early enough. Otherwise, there are so many influences uh, that you know girls and boys will will get that you know. It's, it's really challenging to grow as a girl or a boy or, or something else. So, so if anyone can basically help you to strength with your like, passion or ideas, like you know, if you really would love to be a game developer but you have no clue of the industry or, or you don't know anyone working in the industry, I think that's... Well, at least I have a couple of uh, successful stories from the uh, uh, like younger kids that have been like hugely motivated when they actually realize that they you know based on their limited skills at that point they can uh, improve their skills and also you know become someone when once they are like you know 18 or 20 year olds so it's about inspiring more more people with different backgrounds to consider joining the industry. So it's, it's inspiration, but it's also like, um, like the cultural discussion, like general discussion has to be something else than, you know, um, game development jobs are only for 
coders or developers, or games are only like certain type of uh, titles, because usually the uh, what surface to the general media are the like edge cases in the in the sense that they are like for some reason it's like K18 or it's you know something else so it tells a lot so they are usually those titles that that surface not those like beautiful diversity of indie titles or visual novels or anything like that which could give a better understanding you know, <laughs> what's the like vast like diversity of content as well that you could be creating. Uh, that's interesting because I wanted to, you talked about uh, the, the industry, but I want to stick with the players for a minute because who, who are the next players? But it's, you're saying, Sonia, that uh, the diversity in content will bring a, a greater diversity in, in the players. Is that right? Well, yeah, that's what I believe. I'm, I'm super happy that we have like boutique publishers like Raw Fury or Annapurna or Double Fine, so those that actually can push small indies to the uh, sort of limelight um, and also give a possibility for, for titles that would never ever surface to the, like, the public knowledge would actually be possible, you know, would get the possibility to be uh, like, or get the visibility, let's put it that way. Because that always gives a better understanding. Oh, yeah, games are not only about this, like the old school sort of big publishers or certain type of titles or certain platforms, but it can be so much more. So it's, it's one of the points that was made on the previous panel about that uh, we can do a better job of talking about who, who is inside the industry and what the different jobs are and what the different games are is, is the point that you made. Okay, I, I just Billy. wanted to, to add a thing. We, we see that a lot in, in our community that, for instance, like Overwatch that's been working a lot with uh, inclusion and characters that uh, aren't very stereotypical. Uh, they, they bloom a lot in the female groups. Uh, same with Fortnite, for instance. Uh, so it means a lot with, uh, with role models in the game. So who are the next players? Who are the new players? Who are the next two billion players? Uh, I, would, I would assume that it's, it's much wider than just men or women and trying to make a, a better mix. Is there a bigger picture here? Uh, actually, I heard some statistics saying that the, the biggest growing group in, in eSports are females between 13 and uh, 22. Uh -huh. But there, there might be others as well. And, and do you see um, uh, esports and professional game playing as a way also for people to join the industry, or are those two separate ecosystems? Do you have esport or e athletes joining the industry making games as well? Uh, I would think so. Uh, I think it's connected. But I mean, the, the, the biggest thing with esports is that it's been so it's so easy to to watch. There's a lot of people watching esports uh, that's not playing esports. Um, I heard some statistics saying that in Sweden there's 2, 260,000 people each day watching regular sports and it's almost 400, 450,000 who watch esports every day. So when you look at those numbers uh, and you talk about uh, gender diversity, it's not only about the players and the developers, it's also about the, the gender diversity in the audience. Uh, yeah. So there should be, uh, sorry for thinking out loud, you should never do that on stage. Remember that. But uh, that then should be an incentive for media companies to make offers that will attract a, a more diverse audience. Is that Absolutely. And how, how would that look then? Do you have, do you have a suggestion? Um, for, um, for a media company who, or, who, who wants to uh, have more, a more diverse audience for their e-sport? Yeah, the, the, of course, it depends how, how they're targeting their, their, their like commercials or who, who they are targeting. Like I said before, a lot of females don't feel welcome, so if you want a, a female audience, then you have to show that it's actually targeted to them. So, for instance, maybe use females in the commercials or have like a, a big female uh, esports star promoting or, or talking about it or talking or letting the company talk about why it's important to have a female audience, for instance. We, we see that a lot when we work with big gaming companies, both on, on Remac, which is our, our biggest events, uh, but also um, on, on, the other, on the other side, that when the girls see that the game companies actually care, uh, it means a lot to them because they don't think they do. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, if we stick to the topic of, of esports organizers and esports mm -hmm. broadcasters, do you call them broadcasters? 
or streamers or streamers uh, yeah well those who show the the the, the competitions let's yeah. say We're, we also have the youtubers okay so let's let's add them to the mix yeah or the twitchers or whatever you call them uh, so you outlined some good suggestions that make a lot of sense for what they could do how good of a job are they doing at the moment? Where, if you have a scale from 1 to 10, where all the stuff you said was uh, number 10. Compared to 10 years ago, 10. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I mean, there's always room to, to make it better. Uh, I see a lot of, of movement in the industry, which uh, gladdens me a lot. Uh, so I think we, we're at the right direction. Uh, what I do miss sometimes is that when we talk to, to companies, they're like, yeah, yeah, this is, a re this is really good and uh, we really support this. And then um, it doesn't really go all the way, so in their own company or on their own board and so on, it's, uh, they haven't really reached that far, so they like, they like the idea, but they don't really see how they can apply it to their own company or organization. Uh -huh. So that would be the next natural step? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay, Avelyn, so we, if we move them from eSport to the people in, inside the, the industry, um, uh, first, so on the previous panel, we talked about, or they talked about, how all the different steps of education, but it takes a long time then, even if we were successful to bring more girls into the, the first stages of education. What can be done besides education if you look at the workforce making games right now? Well, I can say something. Yeah. So, sure. for, ex for example, uh, like game jams and involving different parties, like non game developing parties to the mix so that actually also lowers the, the barrier to to get the you know some idea and actually like typically something tangible something like digital ready at the end of the weekend so i think that's at least and yeah the youth youth house example i think already mentioned youth house and schools are doing quite a bit of like like afternoon uh, programs and such which are really good. Very tangible, yes. Yeah, I just want to add to that, that um, all over the world there's um, a couple of organizations helping out kids to learn to code on the weekends or in the evenings, and they've had great success, and a lot of those students actually tend to uh, apply to schools and actually get in. And there is a big one in the US um, specifically for um, African Americans, and they have gotten a lot of people into like Facebook and Google because of those programs and diversity is not just like women or men it's also different different ethnicities different backgrounds it's it's everything yeah that's a really good point and, and I will get back to that point uh, but you're still talking about things that will have an effect f a few years from now or many years from now but what about tomorrow or today? Uh, Johanna showed some numbers. There were hundreds of, of new women joining the Swedish industry last year. What can we do to have a few more hundred when we uh, sum up all the numbers for this year? Is there something, is, isn't there something we can do now that has a direct effect? I don't think there's like an, a magic formula to just fix it in one day. Uh, I think it's also a lot about um, how you perceive your work as well, like the people you work with, and also how people around you respond to you working in the games industry. And if people start to reinforce that a bit better, then I think people will feel more welcome to the industry as well. We, we've been talking with, with some companies that, um, that wants more females uh, working with them and been talking about applications because there's statistics showing that uh, females have a tendency to need to be able to fill all, all the qualifications and if they, they miss one then they don't send in the application. But when guys do it, it's like, yeah, I, I can do three out of ten. This, this is for me. I can do this. Uh, so we've been, talking, we've been talking about uh, forming the application on a, on a different way and a maybe less threatening way. Um, so that, that's one thing that can, can be changed. Uh, but also, uh, in our group, we are, we're trying to um, uh, encourage girls to, to get into tech areas or, or gaming, gaming gigs and so on. So uh, we've been working with companies and uh, sometimes we, we make the application come from us. It's like our, friend, our friends at this company, they, they need a new <laughs> and they would really like to see a woman in this spot. Um, please send in your application. But, uh, okay, that's great and thank you for giving some tangible advice. Now, 
you talk a lot about tech and programming, but that's only like what one third of the workforce. Isn't there uh, other opportunities in games that are in, in less typically male, traditionally male jobs in, in, in design or, or art? Don't we have some low hanging fruit there to pick? Well, I mean, that's, that seems to be more of the area where there are a lot more women represented as well in, in art and anything related to that. It's the, the, the tech jobs that have the least percentage of women in the workforce. So that's where we should focus the most of the efforts. Yeah, I mean, we still shouldn't like lose track of the other areas mm. as well. Like, we should still actively encourage uh, women to apply for jobs. I do want to add to it, though, is that um, you shouldn't necessarily pick a woman for the job if it's like we need a woman for this because of percentages or those kind of things, uh, you should pick someone because they, they fit the job. Yes, right. that I'm, I'm sure that usually there is girls that fit the job, they just don't dare to search for it. Okay, so um, to your point before, uh, Aveline, there are many different kinds of diversity. We're only talking about gender equality here. Um, can we rest can we rely on the assumption that if we do actions for greater gender equality, that will also help other forms of diversity? Or do we need a different tool set or a wider tool set? I think it's a good starting point at least. Um, but I have already noticed that just for feeling like people are more inclusive at a certain company, um, more people with different backgrounds will start to apply as well like also the public representation of them. If you have public figures that are not, okay, I don't want to be rude, but the standard typical white male, then that actually like kind of makes people more interested in applying if they are looking for a safe space to work. Mm. Okay. Um, another point that has been on my mind is that we talk a lot about recruitment, but what I see at least with the Swedish members is that those who have the best success in this field is those who look beyond the recruitment and rather look at it as an organization or management issue. Uh, do you agree with that or would you elaborate, uh, Sonia? What's your experience? Um, yes, agreeing, but then again, the challenge has been that there hasn't been like, enough contacts in the game studios. So if you don't know anyone, there are a lot of very shy people and they don't really just, you know, even though we say that, you know, it's, it's okay, like the, it's very friendly industry, you can, you know, talk to anyone. But of course they won't. They would like to find someone that they can maybe relate to or someone that is more like safer. And that's why I feel that different, like, like women in games, that actually brings like massive value to the ma many of those that are not they don't know the industry too well, they don't know the companies, they don't know the people. So it's very, very, very frightening to go to like IGDA meetup mm. when everyone basically sort of know, knows each other because it's a small industry, except you, who don't know anyone. Mm. Yeah, like, like networking events for, for women would help a lot, um, but... <laughs> We're already doing networking events for women. You, you're doing them. Yeah, that's true, that's true, but we could use more of them actually and also like include um, more different companies and not just the same ones every single time. Mm -hmm. That could help a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, so we talked a little bit about what to do and, uh, and the who and the how, but I would like to just step back and, and ask you why is this important in the first place? The industry is growing like crazy. Um, there's, uh, people seem to be very happy with the games that are being made and played. Is there really, is there really a problem to fix and why? Um, I, can, I can come up with a couple of very um, like practical examples from my like, actual current project. <laughs> so I would say that you know, without... Well, the, basically the, the, the main idea of the game started from like in, in heads of two 30-ish guys. <laughs> and and you, can, you can basically tell, like it's, it's hilarious how the uh, um, roles <laughs> have been distributed. So it's, and the funny thing is that that type of a game is, well, the majority of the players will be like a bit older women. 
So if you have this very like you know, you know like wood cutting man, and then you know like women taking care of the animals and the farm or whatever, like it's come on. <laughs> so so I think it's like it's it sounds like a no brainer, but they just didn't figure it out before it was basically you know said out loud. But hey, what the heck? Like <laughs> what are you guys doing? So that, that's one. So that would be a business reason to better that's understand the audience. Yes. All right. So that's a business reason. Anyone else? No, but I mean, uh, you say that people are happy with the games and that, that people, um, people seem to be enjoying themselves. And that, that's true for one part. But I mean, I see daily in our group uh, girls getting harassed. I mean, we started like separatistic tournaments because as soon as girls play in eSport tournaments, they are the girl in the team. And if the team wins, it's even though they have a girl on the team. And if they lose, it's because they have a girl on their team, which means that uh, they always feel the pressure of being the girl and they have to represent all the girls in the world. If you play badly as a girl, then it's because you're a girl, not because you had a bad day or, you know, this is not really your game. So we started these separatistic tournaments and suddenly the girls could become players and they could become a top laner or they could be, be, become a spotter or whatever. Suddenly they could just focus on the game. And what we saw that um, they started to play in our tournaments and then they also started to play in other tournaments, mixed tournaments. And uh, two out of three times they played this one of the teams, they got sexually harassed before the game even started. So no, it's, it's not good. And maybe a lot of it has been happening behind the curtains, but it's still still a huge problem. I mean, it's there. Um, I mean, it was like last week or something. I was uh, cr cr criticizing uh, a game companies because they released skins uh, to characters that were really, really sexist. And I mean, it took minutes, and then I had like death threats and you know everything, but sh 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 added up. So no, it's not solved, not even close. Right. So so that's not a business reason. That's maybe a principle that it should not be accepted that anybody is sexually harassed. I mean, that should just no. But I mean, the, the company they they are the ones setting the setting the level. They say this is how we play our game. Yeah. And if they are letting stuff like that go, for instance, uh, I was criticizing Riot, which is a huge gaming company, and they let the comments stay. They didn't go in there. They did. They didn't fix anything. They they let all the all, all the people uh, keep harassing. So I mean, that that's setting some kind of value. Um, and, and that's definitely a company thing. They should, they should step down and say, no, this is not how we play our game. This is not how we behave around our game. This is not the, the kind of signals we want to send. But if they just leave it there, then it is the signals they send. Right. So then that would be a business priority to be a, a responsible company, a serious company. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Avelin, why do you think it's important? I actually completely agree with you what you just said. <laughs> like, um, I mean, from my own experience as well. Like, I've I've played in some tournaments in in like higher level as well, and harassment is a serious thing, even if you're not on a team or if you are. Like, like as soon as people tend to find out that you're a woman or that you have something else that is not normal or whatever, uh, you will probably get harassed, and that is not a good thing. And that is something that needs to be solved. All right, so I'm hearing both uh, reasons of, of principle, stop harassment. Everybody can get behind that. I mean, then it's the question of what you do about it and how you deal with the harassers and what's in their heads because they do that stuff. And then there are also business reasons. Nobody said human rights, but I guess human rights is part of, of the principle. Of course. Yeah. Um, uh, w so I'm trying to figure out why I'm doing this, but I want to, I want to find, because I think it's like this. In a lot of industries, uh, they talk about uh, corporate social responsibility. They talk about uh, being a, a responsible corporate citizen, that language like that. Uh, but I think for our industry, it's more profound. It, it's ab about survival. If, if we are to continue to develop as an industry, we, we heard today about the dif difficulties in finding talent. We heard about the difficulties in, in reaching a, a wider audience and, and all the challenges that come into that. Um, I think the message could be uh, that if we don't get this right, we're, we're going to be stuck. We're not going to be able to develop further as an industry. We're going to go backwards into the future. 
and I guess I'm putting words in your mouth, but would you agree with something like that? <laughs> but I mean, um, the, the nice thing with, with eSports, for instance, is that it's constantly changing. I mean, the game that's the, the, been the biggest this year might be totally gone next year. So uh, the gaming industry needs to be really, really sharp and always on their toes and be ready to, to adapt to the, to the new things. Uh, so that's, I think we need, um, uh, we need we need a place where they uh, uh, w to work with new stuff to get new stuff in. Uh, I mean, like for the Battle Royale uh, kind of hype that's been going for two years or something. Um, you, you need the sharpest people and you need the, the sharpest company to be able to adapt quick enough to release the next esports game. Mm. Sonia, do you see a difference? Uh, Lily talked about how this is global and the pattern is the same. Do you see a difference between Sweden and, and Finland, how these things are approached? or, or is it, uh, uh, Let me rephrase that. Do the same solutions work in every place or do we need to make different tool sets for, for different places? Um, I think actually, yeah, same things work. And yes, we do collaborate. So there is a lot of uh, uh, doing together. Um, well, okay, diversity is one, but also I was just thinking that actually, um, so maybe, perhaps we have done things in a, in a too like small scale, because like when you work in the industry, you feel that you know, yes, we have been talking about this forever. I've been talking this for freaking like 20 years, and still like <laughs> nothing changes. But then when I was thinking that, hey, wait, like the chair Koda or Mimit Koda in Finland or women in tech, they are actually like massive, massive events that are addressing people that are not necessarily in the core of the industry or not in the industry at all at the moment, but could, you know, bring something into it. So maybe it's, it's more about like the scale, so we should just like, you know, make it even bigger and, you know, talk about it more and make sure that, you know, everyone understands the, yeah, the needs and the challenges and you know how do we actually deal with with those because we have very strong associations as well to basically deal with like you know uh, like different ways of addressing issues or trying to you know improve things in a, in a collaboration we um, we found something we did uh, or, or women in games together with us and some other people did uh, uh, women and, and um, non-binary labor market day. And, and one of the learnings from that was that uh, there are a lot of people with professional skills uh, that don't have the, industries, n the industry knowledge. So they don't need to learn a new job. They just need to learn the particulars of working in this industry. Um, and that's obviously not only to address the diversity issue, but, but that could be part of, that could be one of the lists like you said, Evelyn, there, there's not a one quick fix silver bullet solution. Uh, I, I thought that was really interesting. We could apply that to uh, different places. Anyway, uh, I'm getting the signal that we're out of time and I don't want to get in trouble with Anton. But I do want to ask you one last question and that is, uh, you have one wish. What is it? I, I now have the power to grant you one wish. <laughs> Anything. One, one with each. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my, my wish is actually like, yes, like more um, divers, like Kickstarter projects or those uh, publishers that actually like share is very different or unique or, or novel ideas in games. Because I think there's, you know, that will also boost the change. Okay. Uh, can I? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what I would like is for everyone in the actual world to have tried making a game at some point and bundling those ideas. I'm pretty sure that will give some amazing games as well. All right. Especially unheard voices. So. Brilliant. I love it. That's bold. <laughs> No right. pressure, Lily. <laughs> Beat that. All right. No. Uh, no, but what I, what I wish is that people would think more and uh, try to see another perspective and also listen. Because you don't need to have experienced the problems yourself. Uh, it's enough that you just listen to people who have and take them seriously. Brilliant. That's the last word on this panel. Big hand. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. All right.
We're almost there, almost there. We have one last agenda item uh, before, before we go to uh, the mingle and networking that we have been bragging about. Because now we have the final remarks and Q&A. You have been very well behaved, dear audience. I'm not saying that just because you did those stupid moves when I asked you. I'm sure you have a lot of questions and now you'll get the chance to ask some of them. But first, uh, when, you know, start thinking about those questions. Uh, because I'll bring some of the speakers back on stage. But first, where are you, Benny? Benny Marcel, yes. Please join me because I know you have some particular insights to share. I might have. <laughs> and, and, and you are with the public organization. Is it, I, I, you, you corrected me before, so now I lost my self confidence. So you, you have to introduce yourself. I'll mess uh, it up. But I would do that. Thank you, Per. <laughs> uh, and I prepared myself here in the afternoon because I wanted to, to make sure that I was keeping on track because I've been very inspired by all the speakers and uh, all the input you gave me. And my name is Benny Marcel, that's correct. <laughs> and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Stockholm and to be part of your conference. Uh, so thank you for inviting us. And back home in Copenhagen, I'm the director of the Nordic Culture Fund, uh, which is one of the official bodies within the Nordic system. There is also the Nordic Council of Ministers we heard about earlier, as well as the Nordic uh, Council. So one of the pressing issues the fund faces is how to make itself more relevant in a redefined and changed Nordic region. We constantly ask ourselves question, as we heard here in the panel just before, but we ask ourselves more like, how can the fund contribute to, a posit to the positive development of art and culture in the region? And what role can it play on work on culture policy initiatives? But first, we've been talking about the Nordic region and what is the Nordic region. The Nordic region uh, is an official form of cooperation consisting of Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, the Faroe Island, Greenland and Åland. And the region has a population of more than 27 million and eight official languages. And the Nordic region is also the 11th largest economies in the world. The Culture Fund's primary aim is to promote and invest in cultural cooperation. And we have been providing grants to thousands of Nordic projects since 1966. The fund supports projects that reimagine and recreate the Nordic concept and enhance cultural life in the region. And we were talking about earlier about culture policy and I have a very concrete proposal to make and that is that we should really take the next step, step and see how we could have a small round table discussion between the different Nordic official uh, bodies to see how we can put your experiences from your first step to a completely new framework. Because I think you were there first on track, but right now I think there are many people who would like to support this in different ways. Uh, so I think in a way that that is a very concrete way of doing it, to continue to talk. The Nordic Culture Fund adds an extra dimension to local, national and regional arts and culture. And as I mentioned earlier, the Nordic region currently has a population of over 27 million. And culture is often described as one of the main components of formal Nordic cooperation and is actually a key element in building relationships and understanding values that transcend national borders. However, we in the culture sphere have noted that the aims of cultural cooperation are not always visible enough or are sustained by myths 
based on an outdated view of the Nordic region. And I think I've learned many things from you, how you see the Nordic region as well as you could see the values of Nordic values, as we heard here uh, just before. Each individual Nordic country has much to gain from nurturing a vibrant culture life in every corner of its territory. You talked about human rights earlier. I believe that a free and independent culture is a vital, vital building block in any democracy and is essential for safeguarding freedom of expression and information. Culture policy right now is changing a lot in the Nordic region. Any new culture policy should strengthen culture's role in society and create better conditions for culture to influence social developments. We believe that we must place greater emphasis on the inherent value of culture as well as the importance of artistic freedom and the role of the citizens and culture in society, as well as on new technology and globalization. Internationally speaking, you were speaking about that earlier, other parts of the world are increasingly looking to the Nordic countries as one single region. And more and more stakeholders are presenting art in a Nordic rather than a national context. We also see the national representatives in Nordic projects at international level tend to operate primarily on the basis of national perspectives. The fund is in a position to help building bridges between national, Nordic and international stakeholders. And for example, by encouraging national agencies involved in international work to collaborate at Nordic level and by strengthening Nordic networks of these national agencies. The fund is also in a position to help make the Nordic perspective visible in key metropolitan <laughs> cultural centers and to play a role on behalf of the region in uh, international areas. And that I think we sh should really continue to talk about how we do that concrete. We must say that the Nordic region also enjoys a rich and extensive cultural life that is undergoing rapid development and change. And this provides actually for you uh, great opportunities to help to define and develop cultural cooperation in a way that would have been impossible 50 years ago, long before you or all were born here in this room. Changes such as globalization and digitization present new opportunities and challenges for art and culture. So um, we therefore need to be better at, I think, identifying games, industries, needs in the light of today's conference and you must make more effort to reach out to new people, to include more people, more consumers, and make better use of the fact that the rest of the world is now looking towards the Nordic region. The trends, as I heard here, and your analysis in the game industry sphere are comparable with other ones in different artistic genres. But you are in a position to say um, that game industries in particular is in a strong position as evidenced by its importance to other creative industries, to the labor market, to exports and to the private sphere. And not at least the game industries brings people together. It's a very big community. So uh, I think game industries, as I heard here, uh, involving and knows no boundaries. And this will give the Nordic countries 
as I can see, as an international region, new relevance, you can give it new relevance and importance. It seems like the game industries, as I heard, shapes the thoughts that shape the future. And maybe that is why this conference has been so interesting, at least for me. So let us continue this dialogue uh, in a new way, in a new setting, and let's do that uh, together. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Benny. Please, please uh, if you don't mind, uh, stay on stage. I love the idea that we shape the thoughts that uh, shape the future. I w I'm going to use that. Uh, I'm going to quote you on that. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Patrick Bach back on stage, and also Jeppe Kalleva back on stage. Please join us. Uh, and why don't you take one of the table mics there, and we don't have to worry about headsets and stuff. Um, we have a few minutes, so... Uh, we might have a question from the floor, but uh, first I wanted to ask you, one, say one thing today that you take away, take with you from this event, Patrick. Uh, I think we, we all seem to agree. Uh-huh. Is that good? Can I say two things? Sure. Yeah, I okay. think we all agree on that. We're, we want a lot, but we can't do it all. So we need to fix that. If it's education, or if it's, we need to you know, find the right people to do the right job, I think there's, there's more to be done than we can do. And I think that's the big takeaway for me, that we all agree. So we need to do that. Good. The collective spirit yep. that you were talking about. Jippe, what do you take away? Um, something that really surprised me is that how in everyday life you become blinded by the things you are doing every day. So I was actually wasn't thinking about how much we already do cooperation actually daily, daily, on a daily basis. So there is a good base for further cooperation, much stronger base than I actually was even thinking about this morning. So that's definitely something eye-opening for me. I would echo that. All right, you have been very patient, and um, now, now is your time. So if you're so smart, give us a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Thomas Westin. All right. Can you make... All right. Yes. There's a mic coming. All right. So here we have one of the most prominent game academics in the world. Oh, thank you for that. No pressure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just uh, adding to the conversation here about inclusiveness. And uh, I think Paris, knowing what I'm going to ask, because uh, we talked about, about women in games. Um, but also uh, what I'm focusing on is... Uh, how to include people with disabilities, uh, both as gamers but also as game developers. So, what have you have you thought about that in some way, or are you thinking to do, do something about that? Good disabilities, both in game developers and in, in gamers. Well, I think uh, making games available is good for everyone, not only for people with disabilities. So, to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer both from an uh, inclusiveness perspective, but also from a business perspective. You, you, know, you want your games to be accessible. You know, from the, you know, even you know, for kids, you want, you know, if kids can play it, you know, it's, it's a good thing. It doesn't mean that kids should play all games, but it's more from an accessibility perspective. You know, the ex more accessible a game can be, the better the game is actually designed. So I will also post that as a challenge for you know, education. You know, make games easier for everyone to play, and therefore your games will be better. So then, to me, it's a no-brainer. It, it makes even it even makes business sense. Benny, uh, accessibility in this very tangible sense. Do you see that also as a public priority? But, but of course it is, but it's not only a public uh, priority, I think it's about equal opportunities. And uh, it should be included, of course, in the, I'm very happy that you raised this issue, because I was thinking about it during this afternoon. When are we going to talk about uh, the, the different challenges uh, within human beings, like disabilities, for instance, but people with, uh, that are injured? What role models are there in the, in the, the games? Uh, how could I identify myself if I'm in a wheelchair? And 
anyway, I have very limited knowledge about your industry, but we heard the last panel here, and it, I think someone said that diversity is not only about women and men, and I like that. And, and let's next conference, could we maybe talk about what is diversity within the game dis industry? And I think you are completely right. You have to do it accessible for, for everyone. If you do that from the start, that will be included. But I think we need to be aware that we are, the, we are diverse. And what does it mean for us? I think it needs some, means something for the business as well. That, something that, good. That, that, that really resonates with me because uh, I had a conversation with um, the developers of, of Mad Max, Avalanche. Do you, I'm sure some of you played that. I'm not going to show, <laughs> do a show of hands again. And, but they said, they said they had fan mail uh, from players of that game uh, that said, we love your game because we have disabilities and every single character in this game have one, some kind of disability. And it struck them that they hadn't, it wasn't a conscious design decision. That was just the way the game world worked. Yes. And, and that really, I think that goes to both of the points. So, Ulf um, Willemsson. If I may add. Oh, okay, you want to comment too, all right. On the accessibility side, so it's absolutely vital for the games industry to secure that new technologies, new digital mediums are accessible to as wide audience as possible. And that's something where the academic research particularly has stepped in to explore the challenges on that side. And the industry itself is also, we have now a big event coming in Paris where the accessibility experts, user design experts, are meeting each other and thinking and sharing knowledge on how to make games as accessibility from as wide different range of different approaches as possible in order to secure that they can be played and designed by as wide audience as possible. Excellent. And also some of the technologies that we make for gamers can be applied in, in other places. All right. Well, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, really happy that that question came up because we have had research on just disabilities and inclusiveness for the last uh, three to four years, funded by Post and TL Studios. Now you can download two games, Frequency Missing, Frequenz Saknad. It's free. It's on App Store, on Google Play. You can play that completely blindfolded. It's, it's developed for uh, serious uh, um, visual disabilities. And you can also download last year's uh, Julkalender Spiel Marvinter. It's designed from the same principle. So we are addressing that question by doing research. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. All right, over here. Who are you, sir, and what's your question? Yes, uh, my name is Simon. I'm a student at Future Games. Um, we have been talking a lot about diversity and things. And some point that I feel like we haven't mentioned that much or drawn that, that much attention to is that we as game developers, we have a uh, responsibility. The games we make influence people uh, in the world. Uh, we influence them through uh, entertainment, uh, through a medium in which you have to uh, open yourself up for influence to be able to enjoy. Uh, so we influence children, we influence adults, everybody during their free time. And that's why diversity and things like that are important. And that generally that we as game designers have a, an actual responsibility uh, to think about and consider things like diversity. And that's one thing I, sh I think should be able to be, um, it should be more brought to attention actually, the fact that we actually have a responsibility as game developers. We're, just not, we're not just making things that we think are fun. We're making things that in, uh, are influencing other people. All right. So we have an ethical responsibility for the games that we make. Uh, as, as a lobbyist for the industry, I always point to the age and content rating systems. Uh, that's educating the consumers. But uh, of course, there's also a, a, a living conversation around these things within the industry and inside the companies. Patrick, do you? Do you have something to share on how that happens? Yeah, I, I would say that you, you should always think about the fact that it's entertainment first. That's at least the games I've been involved in, it's entertainment first. Within entertainment lies many things. That doesn't exclude anything. But it does include the fact that it's entertaining. So as long as it's entertaining, you should do whatever it takes. 
If that means that you include more people to make it more entertainment, which it usually does, you should go do that. If you want to add something, remove something, you should do that. You should not see the fact that it's entertainment as something negative or that it belittles the product in itself. You should see it as an opportunity to include whatever you wanted to include. And you should, should see it as a challenge to be able to push as far as you possibly can to make it more entertaining to more people. And that's always been my focus to, you know, whatever I can do to add to the entertainment value of the product, it will make your game better, period. And that does include that the fact that you have a social responsibility because that it makes you feel good if the product has that, those values as well. And that's what entertainment does. It makes you feel good, even if you get frightened or upset or whatever it is, it's still entertainment. Yeah, and in that word entertainment, it's, uh, it almost invites that kind of conversation. Uh, if you look at other creative expressions with ha with that have other labels, culture or art, are, they don't have to defend themselves. Like no, and I think that that's, that's why we call it an industry. Yeah. Because we're paying people's salaries, we're paying their rent. We may need to make sure that they can keep doing that. I feel that responsibility to everyone that is a part of the company that I'm a part of. I feel that responsibility. So I can't just say that, no, you should sacrifice your family's well-being for the thing that I want to fight for. I also need to pay you know, the salaries. I also need to make sure that people you know, are happy through the chain of the industry. So there's a, you could argue that that's a problem. I see it as a benefit because I, that, that empowers me to make it even more exciting and make it even better. Yeah. Yes, of course, as you mentioned, we have the protection of vulnerable consumers and protection of minor systems, all those things in already place and we must feel, take seriously. We have the accessibility debate and we are trying to secure that. We are trying to uh, secure that our digital communities are as healthy and inclusive as possible. But something that is now emerging is the question of the, uh, with the climate change debate, is the role of the game developers on building these kind of free ICT solutions. And I think that's something that in the game developer community now we have to start exploring and discussing on what does it mean for us to make green games. And that's something new, we haven't perhaps paid so much attention yet, but it's definitely something for the, also the new developers in this audience to think about while learning the code and building their new network infrastructures and uh, cloud services. Excellent. Benny, I'm going to come to you with the last question of the day, because I think what we just talked about, it touches on the age-old debate around the artist and the work, and how we can interpret the responsibility of the artist and the impact of the work. Can we judge the quality of a work, of an artwork, based on the quality of the artist. No, but I think, Patrick, in, in the beginning you were, were you saying some very elegant things, for, for me at least. Because when I came here to this, into this room, I felt like a foreigner, actually a stranger. And then you started up by saying a word like Nordic brand, technology, uh, logical thinking, uh, climate, uh, aesthetics of Scandinavia and you also said storytelling that we were good in storytelling and innovation and creativity so for me it was more about as you ended up by saying brands brains and hands quality a quality of brains and hand that's my that's my answer to your question uh, and to find new people and new talent that I think was, I mean, a door opener. It might be an area for me as well, to find new people and new talented. It's not a closed community. This is an industry that is opened and wants something more in their stories and storytellings. So thank you for that, and that might be my, my very diplomatic answer to your well, I, I love that answer because you gave a really interesting answer that had nothing to do with my question. So I'm, I'm very impressed. So instead, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, and, uh, I mean, it's a question without answer, but I, I leave that to you, dear audience, to discuss <laughs> during uh, the, the networking, the question of, of the artist 
and the work. It's something that we share with all the other creative expressions. Now, thank you so much uh, for being here today, for joining and sharing and engaging. Thank you, dear panelists and the other speakers and the other moderators. Uh, thank you, Finland's Institutet and Kulturfonden and NeoGames and uh, Dataspace-branchen for making this happen. I hope that we get the chance to see all of you again soon and continue this conversation. But now, well deserved, uh, something to drink, I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Anton wants to add. Listen to Anton, because whatever you do, you should always listen to Anton. Is this working? Oh, no. Um, I just want to add that we have students here, uh, so if you want, and they are, will be showing games, so if you want to see, get a glimpse of the future of the games industry, they will be showing some games over by the coffee. Uh, on their, they made mobile games and a few with, you play with game, game pads, so check that out. Excellent point, thank you. We'll be talking about games all day. It's now time to take part in some games. And also you, person up there behind the glass, you did a great job with the, the audio because we had so little difficulties. Thank you, thank you for that. Great job. Now, a well-deserved hand for the, the panelists and for everybody else. Today.